22. Last month, Thailand welcomed the French Minister of Higher Education, Science, Research, and Innovation, Mrs. Sivi Ritayo, and a decla uh, declaration of intent was signed between our two ministers in order to develop cooperation. Being an educational institution, we acknowledge that we have a role to pay, play in developing and serving the community and the society in the greater Mekong sub-region. French research institutes, such as the Research Institute on Contemporary Southeast Asia, on the French National Research Institute for Sustainable as well as other institutes have been very active in Thailand and in the region. Cooperation will be sought, and I can assure that Mepha Luang University will continue to nurture and develop friendly cooperation relations with France. Lastly, I would like to extend my sincere appreciation to the Elasic for the co-hosting of this remarkable event. And I'm personally sure that it will be meaningful and memorable for all of us. And that it will that it will be help to develop to development cooperation with France on the long term. So let's today make the difference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now I would like to invite Professor Dr. Jérôme Samuel, Director of the Institute of Research on Contemporary Southeast Asia to deliver the opening remarks. Please. Good morning, Sawadikap. Bonjour. Salamat pagi. Salam sejahtera. So, um, Mrs. President of Mepha Luang University, Chiang Rai, Assistant Professor Dr. Mashima Nas Nas uh, This is with Vice President Professor uh, Dr. Sujitra Wong Sakasanjit. Mr. Dean of the Faculty of Social Innovation, Assistant Professor Dr. Panupong Chai Wood. Mr. Director Arsid Dr. Nichan uh, Singha Putagun. Mrs. Uh, Flavie Lepoutre. Dear colleagues, dear all, it is a great pleasure for me to be here in Shanghai at Maifa Luang University for our seminar and meeting. Although I have been uh, in Thailand as director of RSX since September 2021, two years ago, it is my very first trip, my very first visit to your city and university. What a shame, I must confess. But I don't regret to be here today and to see uh, this wonderful campus and its uh, nice green environment. I really enjoyed it. At first, uh, Irasek planned to hold a scientific event within the frame of the Year of Innovation 2023, organized by the French Embassy in Bangkok. But since most of the French Embassy's partners wanted to put an exclusive stress on a technology and industry-based approach, we at Arasec, and after discussion among us, decided to open another approach, more in tune with our research disciplines, social sciences and humanities. From this starting point, we tried to find the ideal Thai partner, and it was the Mayfair Wang University's Faculty of Social Innovation. Hence, this seminar here today, with a topic entitled Social Innovation in Southeast Asia, between control devices of change and schemes for social ecological bifurcation. This seminar was very swiftly and smoothly organized thanks to IHASEC's 
local part, uh, local Rehasex local interlocutors. And finally, we are here gathered today and tomorrow, first for scientific discussions today, and uh, tomorrow for a second meeting aiming to plan and organize further common scientific programs. So as for myself, being not a, uh, in no way a specialist of the topics which will be discussed today here, I stop now. And I would just would like to thank you all for being here. And I wish you, you fruitful and enriching exchanges. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, for this morning session, we will have a uh, few presentations. And uh, um, our moderator will be uh, Professor Dr. Catherine Baron from Sciences Po Toulouse. And uh, all the guest speakers who will do the presentation will have about 20 minutes to do their presentations. So I would like uh, to invite Dr. Nishan Singhaputakun uh, from the School of Innovation, Mephal Wang University, to do uh, the first uh, presentation. Uh, they say that if the young generation want to help in terms of tourism and industrial, because GDP in Chiang Rai start from uh, tourism and industrial agriculture sectors, they say that are there any kind of tech reductions to help? Are there any kind of promotion in terms of business for them after the COVID is gone? The last one actually is happening right now in the Mephalung University Councils. And the president also mentioned at this point, how can we find an employment for people during the haze in Mephalung University for short-term period during the haze? Next slide. So the endowment fund, what is the endowment fund? People who, who are handling the forest fire, their safety is a primary concern. So they have sacrificed to stop the fire, which may many times they are injured and they were killed. They don't have any training. Maybe this endowment fund could help for the training for the people. University could be part of that. Uh, th this fund should, a they do, do get a payment, sorry, but get injured injured to get the uh, some disease. So Xing Rai must set up the, in, the endowment fund based on the fundraising or crowdfunding. And this is not the new things. Kua Silapa already have this kind of idea of crowdfunding. It's owned by Xing Rai people. So this fund should uh, come from all sectors, public, private, and partnership. So this fund will covering insurance and also buying necessary fire protection equipments and also for some payments. Next slide, please. The second one, Time Bank. Chiang Rai must set up Time Bank. This bank is jointly formed by public, private, and people. This bank is different from the normal bank. It manages financial based on haze crisis only. So on contrary, this bank is collect time for the volunteer who fight for the fire and can exchange with some different things, with different things, like in hotel, like for the uh, medical assessments, for medical treatment, they can even transfer their credit bank, the time that they service for Chiang Rai people to other people, to their parents, to their kids, to whatever so on in exchange. Next slide, please. Now, it comes to a, a, some action and some model that I have here, sustainable socioeconomic management, which is the midterm. Next slide. This is what uh, we went together to some Doi Tung area about three or four years ago. Uh, during the time I worked for the Thailand History Thailand project. So we apply the public-private partnership into this village. This village used to grow, of course, maize and, and corn based on the closing contract farming. And this becomes the situation of the haze in the Doi Tung area. Next slide, please. So in this case, I decided to come up with something new that Chiang Rai doesn't have. Chiang Rai social enterprise. There is an idea, but there is no ASE. Even in the university now, this concept still not uh, promote as much as possible. So the social enterprise actually use itself as incubators to bring people from different sides and generate the new uh, products for Chiang Rai people. How to make people in Doi Tung stop growing corn is not easy. First, this organization should go to the cooperative bank, to the Ministry of Cooperative, 
and ask to stop to freeze the debt of those people who are in that pirate area. After these people have got the debt to be freeze for some certain period, then other uh, organizations or university can go ahead to grow a new kind of crops or at least to bring the new jobs like furniture or anything designed into this area. Is it very difficult in, in Medjam when I used to work there reaching my university. You cannot ask them to stop growing maize or corn without helping them in terms of freezing the debt. So that is the main challenge. Can we facilitate and bypass this bureaucratic system or not for the sakes of his situation in Chiang Rai or Thailand? And we have to find a new market. In Chiang Mai, there is what's so-called one, one important market called Rimping Market. And they will only get the what's so-called the organic products from the mountain without having trouble with the haze. Next slide, please. So this is the area that we went about four or five years ago with the Haze Free Thailand. It's the area of Doi Tung communities. So we collect seven communities, Doi Tung area village. So as you can see, Hui Pu Mai, Samaki Kao. So all these are part of um, the area that we go inside and we try to transform the situations. And we use the public-private partnership to transform that. And we decided to come up with so-called the, uh, you know, alternative approach for sustainable supply chain with bamboo forest ecosystems. So the bamboo uh, has become the first thing to change from the maize or the corn to be the bamboo. And now we decided to bring faculty engineering, uh, uh, Chiang Mai University, and we get some support from Japanese company to support uh, the faculty in terms to build what's so called the biomass stove. We use the knowledge from the faculty engineering to make the highest combustions more than 10,000 degrees. After you have the high combustion of 10,000 degrees, then there will be no smoke. Then the situation about haze is, has been handled one stage already. Second, now, next slide, please. We use the bamboo as the first primary product for the village. They grow it, they take care of it, and after that, they transform it as the furniture. After they transform it as the furniture, the waste of the bamboo that made the furniture will be put in the biomass stove. Once it's put into the biomass stove, it will be transformed with high combustions, so there will be no haze. Next slide. So this is gonna be my, yes, my last slide, thank you. All of these things that I mentioned, it's not impossible, but we need the new software and new strategies. And it needs to be combined with social science, it needs to be combined with engineering, science, or even medical science. But we have to use some right component, like right key, which is the public-private partnership. Many times when we talk about public-private partnership, we think just only about building the road, building the uh, big things for the state. Build, own, and transfer. But actually, it can be in different manner. And I think my, my paper that I want to work on right now will find a way to design more framework or public-private partnership in order to handle the non-traditional securities, especially environmental challenge in GMS. The last one, of course, many people would ask me why I do not touch the transboundary haze. I also have some idea as well, but I just want to touch here very briefly. It's very difficult to have the cooperation from other country without restructuring ASEAN structure based on ASEAN way on the non-interference principle. Currently, I think Singapore, Malaysia, and different countries try to engineer this already for the last two years. For example, Singapore used private to pressure another private in Indonesia, for instance. We also have something that I don't want anybody to claim and to blame Highlanders as a problem. And right now, today, we talk a lot about soft power. Why can't indigenous people can produce what's called soft power to handle environmental? Actually, they are the one who preserve the environment for quite some time. And the indigenous people in GMS, or at least Lao, Myanmar, and Thailand, 
they share the same identity and culture or preservations of environment. This is going to be the new thing that I think the government should give concern about soft power by indigenous people for the haze management along the border. The last one, this is the last project that I would do next year with military, but I will use defense diplomacy for transforming the haze situations. Use the right professional career of military in order to transform the haze. So I have contact with the Ministry of Defense and next year they will come here and they will have some talk. Maybe they can do something like a, a joint border commissions based on haze specifically. Defense diplomacy doesn't not only to rely on traditional securities or severity only, but they can also help in terms of haste and transboundary haste. That is my last presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Oops. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ishan, for your presentation and for the perfect timing of the presentation. Um, we will have a discussion, global discussion at the end of this session, but maybe if you have some uh, very short questions of clarification, maybe we could ask you some of these uh, questions now, very short one, not the debate, but... Uh... No? Thank you so much, Dr. Nishan. Just a, um, a question about the last point on the intervention of the military. Uh, what is it um, designed for? What would be the purpose of the, the defense here? Many times when you, we use foreign policies, that's work somehow. But somehow when you come to uh, the transboundary issues and it come to the sovereignty issues, the only actors, agent that could help easily is military of each of the countries. So I see this as, as the strength that no one picked up yet. I want them to help, not just in terms of to protect the frontier line of the border, it's the old securities. But the new security that we are challenging is right now is human securities, it's environmental securities, it's the climate actions. So how could military provide some diplomacy? If you look at the defense diplomacy, there are something like 13 points of what is defense diplomacy. Most of them working on a joint operation, preparations, but no one touch upon of this point in terms of pace. Yes, during the time of uh, tsunami, some joint operation of military help during that time. I use the same idea of that point, but I this time I would use for the haze in GMS. So it's still in uh, uh, developing an idea with the military uh, at, the, at the defense uh, ministry there. So next year, I think I will get some more in depth, the framework and how we're gonna do to link with this uh, two countries or three countries in GMS as the upper ASEAN. That's my answer in chart. Thank you. Thank you. So there is a change in the program because uh, um, Dr. Manohan is not here yet. So maybe Professor Ajanchayan, could you make the presentation now? Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm very pleased to be invited to join this uh, Ira Sigma Falong seminar uh, or exchange, I believe. Uh, I, I understood that the topic is about social innovation, which is quite new to me. I, I'm not familiar with this concept, but however, I think I will bring some example of uh, a small research project in Lampun that can be seen or can be interpreted as, as <clears throat> a social innovation by the local people in the South. Right? Uh, what is social, in social innovation? 
uh, this is what I understood or trying to understand. Uh, social innovation is the ability of the uh, uh, people <clears throat> to develop or invent a body of knowledge which can be used to address uh, their problem. And it, it should be something that the people, the local people themselves would like to solve their problem. <clears throat> Innovation can be a technology or a body of knowledge on how to solve a particular problem while social innovation involves people who share the same problem. So this may be, this kind of uh, uh, interpretation may be applicable to our previous presenter on the PPP, like that. There are uh, <clears throat> a kind of uh, different stakeholders trying to find ways to solve a problem. But in my case, I would like to emphasize upon a knowledge production, production, not a particular technology to solve the problem. <clears throat> uh, to me, social innovation needs collaborative efforts of individuals or actors in learning to address the common problem. Okay. So this is just what I try to, to interpret <clears throat> <clears throat> or to understand social innovation by myself. Yeah? In other words, uh, it, is, it should be something that is social innovation should be different from a kind of a ordinary or common innovation, like technical uh, solution to a certain problem. <clears throat> For example, uh, the, we, we heard about carbon credit, right? carbon credit project uh, to address uh, global warming, uh, this can be seen as an innovation. But if it is not part of the, if there is no people's part participation in the use of carbon credit, for example, if uh, this idea of carbon credit is, <clears throat> is to allow big companies to grow forests, the big company will hire local people to go trees, and then the big company will sell carbon credit to uh, EU or to Western countries. So I wouldn't call this as a social innovation. Huh? It's a more or less an, an exploitation of, of local farmers. Mm -hmm. social, me social innovation means that, that the people in the community work together to develop new knowledge or practices to address the problem, the, 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 the problem of their commons. Right? I'm trying to link the social innovation to the, common, the concept of the commons. Right? Social information aims to address social issue, societal issue with uh, technological innovation, uh, which may focus on technical problem only. Uh, so it's not, I, would, I wouldn't call this kind of uh, uh, innovation as social innovation. Mm -hmm. This is just an example. Too. Now, uh, we, I, I raised two issues here. Social innovation is supposed to ease or solve problem of the commons. And social innovation is a product and as well as a process of knowledge production. <clears throat> Here, I think we may want to use, we want to discuss about this concept of how social innovation is linked to the issue of the commons. Right? I think what this is what uh, Catherine and have uh, been dealing with for some time. Maybe you can uh, lead us to understand how we can conceptualize these. Uh, in this relationship between the social innovation and the commons. Again. We are losing a lot of what we call the commons, like forest, water, and also uh, air, for example. In the case of air pollution, air is the commons. <clears throat> so how social in innovation can uh, provide <clears throat> linkages to the commons. Right? So I'll, this is a this is some. This is a kind of introductory part of uh, my presentation, and I hope that 
we can use these ideas to discuss uh, when we have time. Right? Now, moving to uh, the, the real problems in Northern Thailand, again, the haze is very important, but as you may have know, or noticed that we have entered into what we call agrarian transition in Northern Thailand, meaning the changing of the subsistence agricultural production to uh, commercialize uh, agricultural production. Let me give the example. <clears throat> A small province south of, of Chiang Mai, we can call it a kind of city, uh, uh, sister city. Lampun is, is located in the, <clears throat> what we would call the Chiang Mai Lampun uh, Valley, like, Sura, like Chiang Mai Sura, but the mountain. So it has a fertile land, fertile land for rice growing <clears throat> traditionally. Besides rice growing, uh, there are, the, the farmers grow soybean, garlic, and other vegetable uh, and other vegetable uh, for consumption. This is uh, around <clears throat> fifty years ago. The uh, Lampun is still in this kind of a small agricultural uh, communities, subsistence production. That now <clears throat> the. The, the people from Lampun, most of the farmers, uh, they were introduced to Longan. Do you, do you know Longan? I'm sure. Longan. Uh, <clears throat> almost, in fact, it was introduced to Lampun and Chiang Mai for more than a hundred years ago. <clears throat> but it was grown not for commercial, not as commercial crops until the last maybe 20 years ago. When, <clears throat> see, this is a before the longan tree uh, is called a seasonal longan because it's for what it's a uh, it's a uh, it, it bears fruit uh, once a year, right? And they, they the fruit are sold to local market mostly and sometimes to Bangkok, right? <clears throat> but uh, there was an incident. Uh, some farmers keep this chemical, potassium nitrate and potassium chlorate, near a longan tree. Right? And this uh, family, they would they, they made a, 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 a what is called the, the fry cracker. So this one day, this there's a there's a the the, the the uh, this family, which makes fried cracker in Chiang Mai, uh, his his workshop making uh, fried cracker uh, was set on fire because of the uh, potassium chlorate. Like that. So and and uh, later they discovered that this uh, potassium chlorate or potassium nitrate allow or trigger long country to bear fruit all year round. It does not have to be in one one season only. So long and in Lampun can be uh, harvest off season, mean all year round, if the farmers put this kind of fertilizer and chemical to, to the trees, right? Now, uh, <clears throat> during that time, the price of long and was was low, more supply, meaning the price is lower, right? But uh, because of the free trade agreement between China and ASEAN, particularly China and Thailand, it's allowed the farmers in Lampun to sell longan to Chinese markets because there's a, there is an increased demand from China. Uh, for the Chinese people, longan is considered as medicinal fruit, and uh, <clears throat> particular for women, they would like they would prefer to to eat longan mostly dry rather than the fresh uh, after they give birth to babies. Right? 
So longan long become uh, a commercial crops in Lampoon in the last 30 years. Right? Uh, both fresh and dry longan uh, are regularly exported to China. <clears throat> now, now the the Lampoon rice farmers start to stop. <laughs> what happened to Ah, uh, here. <clears throat> so uh, they start to convert their rice field into uh, uh, long end farms in order to earn more cash for their in family income. So in Lampoon, after this, uh, 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 FTA and the and and long end become a commercial crops. So it's be, long end become the main cash crop or main commercialized crop in Lampoon. And instead of the farmer, instead of growing different types of vegetable and fruit trees, they become uh, in, involved in Longan uh, more and more. And uh, to grow a good Longan trees, they need to use heavy chemicals and fertilizers. <clears throat> now, what happened to these uh, farmers? Are they become rich, or become uh, 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 <clears throat> become more uh, be, be able to sell their longan to the Chinese consumer or the the uh, Bangkok consumer? But uh, they, what they discover is that. Uh, after they're engaged in this long end production, they have to invest a lot of money due to the increased, increasing use of chemical fertilizers and, and insecticides. So, and also they have to pay for the high uh, labor during harvesting season, meaning that uh, to engage in long end production as commercialization, as commercial crops, they have to invest in more money in chemical fertilizer in pesticide and also the input from and also spend a lot of money to high laborers to have this to the rapid long end. They need to pay this because if you don't harvest the long end in time, the wrong the long end will be too ripe to sell to to export to uh, China. Mm. So they need to use uh, labor. Most some sometimes you will be surprised that labor high high labor does not come from Lampoon province. They come from either. It's in fact that some from come some come some come of coming from highland villages yeah, to stay in the longan farm and harvest the longan during the the harvest season or. Some labor are from Cambodia. They came to uh, work in in Longan farms. And, but what is interesting is that <clears throat> the more the Longan farmers are involved in this uh, commercialization crops, they found that uh, the Longan market has been controlled by the Chinese buyers. First. This long end is sold to local buyers in one community who then sell the long end to the Chinese buyer or in Thai language they call long jin, meaning Chinese buyer. So now, now and in, in, in fact, not, not only this year, but in the last almost last 10 years, long end markets is totally controlled by Chinese buyers who then export long end to China. Similar to uh, Thai farmers in Jantaburi and Shonburi, who produced durian. Durian is, has become a famous uh, fruit uh, for Chinese consumer, but the, the, the durian market now has been controlled by Chinese buyers. Chinese buyer came to set up their buying buying uh, 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 shops and pack them up 
and export to China. <clears throat> the Chinese also use uh, what is understood in China in Chinese called guanxi. It's a, a kind of social relation system that help to control uh, uh, the 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 buying, selling and buying of the of the goods. In other words, uh, all the Chinese uh, buyers in Lampun, they are they are linked through this guanxi, so that they can they know uh, how to, that each of them will set the price to for longan each day, how many bats per kilo they can buy uh, longan. So the local uh, farmers cannot uh, negotiate with these buyers because of this guanxi system. Right? So they they set the price of the long end according to the size of the long end. But more importantly, uh, the long end farmers face health risks and also uh, death problem because of the use of chemicals. So when they have a blood test, they found that uh, there are some chemicals in in their blood sample. Now. <clears throat> Facing this particular problem, the lo the long and some of the long and farmers try to find ways to uh, uh, <clears throat> to deal with uh, the monopolization of long and tr uh, trees in Lampun. Mm. What they want to do is to uh, kind of try to critically understand the problems coming from the commercialized uh, long can production right so they 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 see that one of the way to get out of these uh, uh, problem is to switch to uh, organic farming not to uh, do uh, uh, commercialized farming right <clears throat> But in in doing so, it's not difficult. It's not easy to, for for them to do because organic farming means that first the the decision has to be uh, collectively understood by the family members. The wife was important. The wife of the farmers I also need to be consulted and also agreed upon that they, she will let the hus her husband to practice organic farming and also the children. So the whole family have to make decision together to switch from cash crop economy to organic farming. Mm. Uh, meaning also the first is about the family support. And second, they have to make sure that if they go for organic farming, they uh, are not going to get large amount of money at the end of the year, but they have to make plan to to switch from monocropping to uh, <clears throat> multi <clears throat> multi crop production, growing not only long end but also other crops that can bring some income, a uh, weekly, monthly and yearly right? uh, then and, uh, and and thirdly uh, they they realize that these dishes if they want to do organic farming they cannot do by themselves but they need to form a network a network of farmers who would like to change from the commercialized <clears throat> agricultural production to organic farming then so there was uh, so the the this group of farmers decided to join a a research project supported by Thailand research fund and they um, they have to work in groups so they form a network networks of farmers who are interested in organic farming so they form a team, research team, and uh, select and, and also uh, 
shoes team members from different uh, locations, different villages in a, in a, a watershed uh, system. Then they uh, have a group discussion to reflect upon the problem that they have faced in uh, commercial crops. Right? So they reflect upon and try to analyze the problem together. Right? So they, they, they move from one step to another step. The second step is reflection. The third one is to together, uh, they visit, they make a few visits to some uh, organic uh, of, uh, kind of organic farmers in, diff in other provinces, in Chiang Mai, for example. Uh, <clears throat> and they learn from those few trips from the, the, the farmers who have already practiced organic farming, acquiring knowledge from the other sources, not only from the farmers who, who, are, who have been successful in practicing organic farming, but also working, learning from NGO who are promoting uh, organic farming in, in Chiang Mai. Mm -hmm. Then from this information, these group of farmers, they, they would like to more or less do an experimentation of how to uh, practice organic farming by themselves. So in other words, learning from practice, each of them has a plot of land. So based upon knowledge they gathered from uh, resource person and other organic farmers in Chiang Mai, they try to develop their knowledge and build a network of learning of uh, build a, a kind of a build a network from organic farming by themselves and then uh, at that stage they improve upon their produce uh, uh, improve but more but they they were able to uh, produce uh, organic vegetable right, or, or products, agriculture products. But the big challenge for them is how to sell it to the market. You can have the supply, but if there's no demand, they cannot sell their products, right? They have tried to contact a, a hospital, but they found out that uh, in the hospital, you cannot easily put your sell your vegetable to to the hospital or to the uh, patient not the patient for the relative of the patient uh, because in a district hospital there is also a monopolization of uh, <clears throat> catering inside the hospital. You know, someone who is inside the hospital. Uh, monopolized buying rice, buying vegetable, etc., to to uh, to uh, and 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 sell it to the kitchen. So you, all these organic farmers cannot penetrate into hospital. So it's very difficult. That's why they have to try their try to understand how to sell, uh, how to create market at different local at different level, at the uh, community level, at the and or at the district level, they sometimes bring their produce to sell it into market, the organic market in Chiang Mai. Right? So production and market is very important for them. <clears throat> and these four or five steps of learning uh, <clears throat> are done by this group of farmers from Lampun. They document all this process by themselves and write their experience in trying to learn how to uh, practice organic farming. Right? And after that, uh, they uh, try to link uh, their network of learning to what they call river basin organic ag agricultural network. Okay? But <clears throat> again, uh, 
because this is a research project, the, uh, the, the funds to support this project ends within two or three years. So after the, after the research project was, was ended, they, were, they could not uh, uh, expand the activities. But, but, at a set, but what is interesting is that this is a network of learning uh, among those who would like to change commercialized long can to organic vegetable. This is an attempt to uh, learn or, or knowledge, what, what I would call co-production of knowledge among farmers to, to find social innovation uh, in order to solve the problems of the farmers uh, these days. Now, <clears throat> yes, five minutes, okay. Uh, <clears throat> so, well, you, we, we can talk more about this. Uh, what, what, uh, what, what do, what, what, how do they do research about this? So now this is, oh, and, and the last issue that I would like to bring to, how we can learn from this network of learn, learning of these organic farmers as a, what we would call co-production of knowledge, right? Again, from the introduction by, I'm, I'm sure that by, by, by Jerome about, about what we are, what we aim to uh, uh, achieve during this two days is to discuss about this co-production knowledge, which has been uh, interpreted by different groups of people. In my case, I, I uh, discuss about this co-production knowledge based on, on the one hand, based on Elena Ostrom model uh, or the stakeholder approach so on the left-hand side, but I also propose another co-production co knowledge on the right-hand side based upon Taiban Research Project, which is an attempt to co-produce knowledge in order to uh, change the power relation, the, the knowledge for counter hegemony, uh, either in dam construction or uh, uh, <clears throat> commercialization of cash crops as the case of Longan Zilampun. Okay, this is some some ideas. I, I hope that uh, this can be some uh, fruit for discussion of our participants in this seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ajahn Shayan. I think it uh, focuses on uh, the subject of uh, social innovation with a great discussion at the end of the session, for sure. Okay, so now we welcome uh, Professor Manohan. Um, and uh, maybe you can uh, make the third presentation, 20 minutes presentation. Very, uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry, uh, just before your presentation. Are there some questions, very specific question, clarification questions on the presentation of uh, Ajahn Chayen? Gabriel, sorry. Yes, <clears throat> I will have some reactions, but more on the content. So later um, during the discussion and for more specific and short questions, uh, just you mentioned the uh, Thailand Research Fund. Uh, what is it in some words? And also finally, after all this experience, have those peasants um, been able to find any uh, buyer? Thank you. Should, should I? Entertain his question. Yes, first, yes. first of all, uh, Thailand Research Funds uh, initiated what is what is called the community based mm -hmm. research C CBR around nineteen ninety eight right, to support to channel research fund from Bangkok mostly to. Uh, a local researchers, or we, they call the 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 um, <clears throat> NGO and local people who would like to use this 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 fund 
to try to to uh, to f- use its fund to to understand the problem that they are facing in their own communities, and use this process to solve the, solve the problem by themselves. Right? Uh, the the, <clears throat> the this fund ended uh, already, but uh, I was involved in in doing an evaluation of this project, particularly in different regions of Thailand, different models of uh, community-based research, right? By comparing with uh, the Taiban research, which my colleague and myself developed in 1997, about that. Uh, the second question is about what? Are you able to find any buyers? Oh, uh, again, this is a very good question. The organic farmers in Lumpur, uh, they can they can find buyers, right? Some some uh, some buyers, but they can. The, but uh, yeah, they, they, are, they are different model. Some of them have been able to sell organic vegetable to to modern market to to, to sell it to uh, macro. You know, macro the wholesale. Yeah, macro. Yeah, it was uh, to Lotus, for example. Uh, they can sell their products at the village level at the, during the weekends, yeah? but still, still limited because these. What well, I would, to my analysis, these organic farmers have not been able to to make the organic farming as a social movement. So they cannot connect with the larger network of organic farming producers, right? So they're kind of a localized group of farmers, right? Again, to practice organic farming, they need the support of their whole family. It's not, not a single man decision. Right? If your wife does, does not agree with you, then you cannot practice organic farming. Right? It's very uh, kind of a, not only uh, <clears throat> individual decision making, but it's collective decision making of the whole family. Right? And of course, uh, the middle class also have to be educated of how uh, of of how of, of of the values of organic farming. Now, I think slowly, if you compare this uh, twenty years ago, now organic market has has now grow has been growing in in many provinces um, particularly among the uh, middle class urban middle class yeah. <clears throat> thank, you. thank you very much no other questions oh yes there is one other question Can... <laughs> yes Uh, uh, okay, so thank you very much for Chan Chayan to uh, present this topic. <laughs> uh, I'm very happy to hear how can you say Chan Chayan's presentation today because I think like that we left the topic of agrarian transition quite long time. So how can I say we used to work for, for example, I myself did the research in Lampu oh. in around 2003. Oh. And since then, I never visit them. <laughs> so I'm happy to hear today, how can I say, from Ajahn Chaya about the Lampu situation. Mm. But recently, actually this year, I visited the Chai Prakan. And I also noticed a similar situation. Mm. So, and, uh, so... For Ajahn Chaya, I, I read one paper by Ajahn Terry Lambo that he said nowadays agrarian transition in Thailand is like peasants. In the past, we always researched about the peasants, but now they began to be entrepreneurs. Like, like they, they began to have like the, their own business. Mm. So in the past, we used to say that, okay, how in the future, like, the, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, we wondered how, how can I say, how farmers in Thailand can survive. Right. 
but now, so Ajahn Chayan see that the possibility right. of their way to survive is this this way, like the social innovation and going to be like entrepreneur or something. The, now, now the, there is an organic longan groups of uh, organic longan producers. So there's sort of a niche market for this. As well. Thank you. So now we are going to listen to the next presentation. Thank you. 20 minutes, is it okay? okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you for uh, Ajahn Flavi, which that invited us to here today. <laughs> and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I have to confess that uh, there are many things in my head but I cannot capitalize this in the short term. So uh, this is the reason why I would like to present about the preliminary survey on the relationship uh, between modern life and health. Yeah. Because uh, in, in this area or the northern area, we face the problem of health pollution every day, uh, every year uh, around the end of February to May, yeah, this is the big problem that uh, we cannot uh, solve it until nowadays. And uh, the reason why I, I try to find the, the party to take the responsibility on this issue. This is the reason why I choose this, uh, this presentation today. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I I use the uh, I apply the historical approach you know, to to try to investigate uh what is the problem and how can we include many party to take responsibility on this issue. You know, I I will start. Uh, 2007 to 2000, uh, 2023 or uh, nowadays. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for the for the the issue of health pollutions, there was the conflict between the the rural area and uh, the urban area or the middle class society the yeah, middle class society uh the heavy the heavy of this conflict uh happened in in 2000 around sorry uh 2010 yeah, 2010 uh and I, I try to investigate back that what happened yeah, what happened in the in the area that related to the, the issue. Like uh, I try to find the, the how can I say, the, uh, the picture from the satellite to monitor the, the forest fly or the hotspot. Like, uh, in, in that year, around, 2000, around 2010, uh, the, Middle class society try to blame, try try to blame the the farmers as the cause of the problem, not the cause of the haze pollution. That like they ignorant, uh, they ignorant in smart farming. They ignorant in the externality cause which uh, impact on the society, something like that. And they try to uh, to merge the problem of haze pollution with the, the politics after uh, general election, general election, okay. general elections in 2011. Like if, if you see this, this picture, this picture is like a, uh, how can I say? Uh, actually, it's separate. Yeah not related at all, but uh, the middle class society try to merge it and try to uh, fire the victim and the people who takes responsibility uh, on this issue, like uh, uh, 
uh, like uh, the people who who choose เพื่อไทย in northern and northeast part uh, of Thailand as the people who ignorant in both term of politics and uh, in term of the pollution uh, how can I say like uh, the poor the poor the poor farming thing like that and uh, they try to blame like a uh, the the traditional lifestyle like uh, the people who who find the food stuff from the forest like head pot right head pot <laughs> I could not translate head pot in English but <laughs> mushroom right mushroom that grow after the forest fire came right and uh, another another one pak wan. <laughs> vegetable right uh and khai mot dang and eggs <laughs> this tree full stuff from the forest uh will blame as the victim of the forest fly but the the big question for uh for this issue is like uh, how much the market size how much the market size of this kind of food stuff when we compare to the uh, the modern protein food stuff like a uh, chicken, uh, beef, pork, and egg milk? Okay. Uh, actually, if we uh, if I you uh, apply the the historical approach to to investigate is like uh, the problem is embedded in in the Thai society long time ago. Since uh, since we have the uh, the first economic and social national development plan that we will try to to change our uh, our society to be the industrial sector uh, industrial revolution something like that and. Uh, uh the the situation that we we would like to be the uh the middle middle class society this is became another another factor that i will catch it to uh to speak today now, like uh we are uh, how can i say Almost people in Thailand right now, we are in the middle class society. And uh, what about the middle class society lifestyle? I would like to ask you that uh, we cook every day or not. We we cook by ourselves or not. No, we don't have time. We work for uh, six days per week and uh, uh, in the day, we uh, we work for a uh, more than eight hours per day. We don't have time to cook. This is like uh, the lifestyle as the demand to uh, to get protein or the food stuff from the market, from the convenience store, from the uh, modern trade store. Like I use this picture. Uh, from SCB, like uh, how can I say, uh, wrap, wrap, wrap plastic, plastic bag like a thung kang, right? Mat thung kang in Thai. This is the symbol to 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 explain everything that we are in the middle class society. We uh we go to market every day and find the food stuff, So. It means that we could not, uh, we, we we could not select all kind of the food stuff to cook in our kitchen. This is the reason why this power belong to the the modern trade and also belong to the 
uh, the big corporation that involved in the agro industry and agri, how can I say, agri business, agro industry in Thailand. There is uh, the demand of life of the demand for livestock that I uh, collect the data from the uh, the national statistic office. Yeah. Do we see the green line? Uh, the green line represent the total, and uh, for the uh, like uh, the chicken, right? The, the chicken, and look at the total, right? It's increased and increased uh, since uh, two thousand. 2001 yeah, to uh, last two years, yeah, last two years ago. And uh, the livestock, the livestock market need maize yeah, to, to serve the animal feed industry. Yeah. So this is the, uh, the situation that happened in uh, maize farming. In in Thai, uh, in in five in five province in five provinces of the northern uh, that grow maize. Uh, you will see like uh, uh, the upwards the upward sloping or the how can I say like uh, the increasing trend uh, since two thousand and six to uh, to 2014 and after that it will decline there there was there was the factor that uh, lead uh, this volume decline like uh, the middle class society they arouse uh, arouse and uh, they recognize the problem and try to launch the campaign uh, many campaign in 2000, uh, 2016, yeah, 2016, like uh, uh, the famous hip hop rapper, yeah, Joey Boy, uh, launched the campaign. Just, how can I say, plan now yeah, in Thai we call it. Yeah, and uh, he choose uh, Nan as the, the pilot project yeah, because when we look at this graph, sorry, uh, look at this graph, we will see that non wins uh, the green, uh, the green, the green line, like uh, the most area in the top knot part, uh, the top knot, the top knot, uh, the top knot of Thailand, uh, that grow uh, maize. Uh, and uh, is how can I say it's like uh, the result the results of this campaign is impact and and it impact uh, and uh, drive the society to the positive way because the the trend of mass grow decline decline but. After that, what happened? The the haze pollution uh, became heavy and heavy yeah. because maize production right now not specific in the in in the area, especially in in Thailand. But it became the the how can I say the global production network already under the I can say wait, sorry sorry <laughs> under the economic the economic cooperation like uh X make sorry Next, uh, the, the slide. Next, 
externalities impact uh, this thank you uh, the x mix นะ 11 ดีเจ้าพยาแม่ของ economic cooperation strategy this uh, agreement transform the the mass production became the uh, the region or the the global production network and uh, and uh, as as we know the multinational corporation who who drive this uh, production the multinational corporation uh, like a uh, represent itself like uh, the free how can I say like uh, the free mobility right the free mobility capital they can move from one country to another country under the the agreement and as we know they move to uh Lachan, right Lachan, Myanmar and uh, uh, do the uh, do the business like uh, the contact farming, yeah, the contact farming, and the contact farming is not clear, yeah, not clear. They can hide themselves, yeah, they can hide themselves uh, behind the scene. And this is the reason why it's very really difficult to uh, how can I say to identify. Who will take the responsibility on this issue? Because the big corporation claim that they, uh, they are not the the factor of this problem because never uh, have never support farming to to burn to burn the uh, the corn field or the maize fields. Okay, okay. Social innovation. Okay. For the social innovation that uh I hope I hope to see. Yeah, I uh, I hope to see. Uh, okay. Uh I would like to to propose the the internalization. This is the basic concept when we when we study the public finance in economics major, yeah, but it's very really difficult to 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 do it yeah, to do it because we cannot identify clearly in the uh, the, pe the, the the group of people who take the responsibility yeah. the farmer yeah, maybe the, the the farmers the big corporation or the the, the consumer we need uh, we need the the big data yeah, the big data and and some concept to to catch up and and groom it to be the uh, how can i say to be the tool yeah, to like uh, collecting the data collecting the data uh, and and draft the blueprint yeah. maybe <laughs> maybe the the social partnership in the future that ajahn nishan will continue from from me yeah. Okay. If uh, we look at, if we 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 think that the farmer should take the responsibility, yeah, please look at the the profit miss plantation yeah, in two thousand four to uh, some area in Chiang Rai, two thousand two thousand sixteen. Yeah, very small profit. Yeah. They cannot split their profit and invest in the new innovation or uh, take responsibility in the internalization anymore. So maybe uh, other kind of the partnership and include them yeah, to the partnership. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, are there some questions of uh, clarification, short questions? Yes. Okay. 
Good, uh, good morning. So thank you very much for interesting um, topic today about life and haze. Actually, my name is Remy. I am from Archit. So uh, the topic of this one is almost similar to what I'm doing now. Actually, I have a one research about slash and burn uh, agricultural practices that related with the myth of the fire. Actually, I want to ask your uh, preliminary result related to the myth of fire that you show to us. Actually, how does the myth of fire actually can relate to the cost-effective method of land clearings in your um, top in your uh, research? Hopefully, you you your research is touched in that level, or even maybe we just cover in that kind of topic, especially for local community and ecosystem. Thank you. Uh, thank you for Jalani' question. Uh, the myth, the myth of fires and uh, the land use, right? Uh, actually, when 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 we look at the the hotspot, uh, the hotspot from the the satellite, we we can point that that area belong to the national. Uh, the national the national park or in the agricultural area and uh, but uh, sometimes we, we 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 find that the the hotspot happen in the national park uh, in the national park uh, immediately we 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 think that that meet, uh, that fire from the traditional life from the local people but when we go to the, the 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 real area we will find that this area is the agricultural area we we, we cannot uh, this is like a how can i say uh we, we have to prove again uh, uh, again uh, when we see the uh, the fly from the hotspot. No. This is maybe the sometime uh, make us miss uh make us think that is as the ignorant from the the local people something like that. Uh, I, I I'm I'm not sure that I I can answer you uh, answer or not. Okay, so maybe we can keep the other questions for the debate at the end of the session uh, perfect timing so maybe we can have a short uh, coffee break uh, for let's say let's say let's say 10 minutes let's say we come back at 11 is it okay only five minutes late it's wonderful thank you very much <laughs> and see you soon community-based economy and social entrepreneurship uh, by uh, Xavier Guillot from uh, University of Bordeaux and uh, Dwi uh, Pertiwi uh, from Indonesia. So for 20, 25 minutes presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Does it work? Okay, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for Irasek to invite us. Thank you for take my classes because I can't speak. <laughs> my Fong University Social School of Social Innovation, Asian Research Center for International Development, and the French Upper Mekong Subregion Academic Corporation Center, and Flavi in particular. Thank you for your welcoming. Um, this is a this is a, a communication with two voices. Um, that would carry out, Dwi Pertiwi and myself. And uh, 
on my own, uh, instead of uh, giving a long uh, academic speech, I'm going to give the time to Dwi Pertiwi to talk because it's her experience that is more useful to listen to. Afterwards, we can uh, discuss and theorize based on her experience. However, a few words to explain why Dwi is here with us today. When uh, Gabriel Facal invited me to take part in this workshop and mentioned the theme, social innovation, I must confess, dear Gabriel, that I did not know really what does it mean. I pretended to understand so as not to lose face and said, okay, after getting informa informations, I knew what it was all about. And I did not have much trouble and hesitation in identifying the person and experience most likely to present what I thought was a wonderful example of social innovation, the commitment and work of Dewey Pertiwi. Why? Yeah. Because her action embodies a set of objectives and values that are extremely dear to me and which also resonate with a research work we are carrying out together now and we all have the chance to talk about tomorrow. Dewey created a superb place called Omar Lor. I spent a few weeks, a week with her in this place and she's going to talk about it now. Before, there are three things I would like to say to introduce the place and Dewey. First of all, Dewey's commitment addresses two key issues of our time here and elsewhere, which are to rethink our food production system and our relation with Earth. And with the imperative to reformulate rural alternative to agriculture boosted by modernity, mechanization, and chemistry. It's a battle that's being waged everywhere in Europe and Asia. Omar Law and her foundation, bring in, have been battling the same war since 2006. Secondly, what's important to underline and what is singular about Dewey Pertiwi works is that the form of alternative social innovation, to use the term of this workshop, are by no means utopian alternatives, disconnected from the economic world. Because Dewey Pertiwi, as well as being an activist, she has a solid knowledge of the business world. This enables her to facilitate the creation of space of dialogues between the world of capitalist economy and the local economy, and to create, as you said, Dr. Nishan, a people-public-private sustainable partnership. In relation to our academic issues on post-development, her work feeds this issue by providing proofs that there are an intermediate, radical, and sustainable forms of development that draws on both the alternative world and the dominant economy. Last but not least, Dewey is a woman. She embodies the virtuous link that will forge the ecological struggle with the value of ecofeminism. Looking at her work, I've often thought of the essential book of Maria Miss and Veronica Benholt Thompson called Sustenance, an Economist Perspective. To me, Dewey's work 
could well have been included among the examples to be found in this remarkable book and the message it calls out. Thank you, Dewey, for being here. And I give you the microphone. <laughs> Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Sylvia, for the introduction and bringing me here. I already learned a lot from the previous uh, speakers. Uh, disclaimers, I uh, will not speak any of academic terms here. You're welcome to give the term what, what I'm going to share. I'm going to just share my experience. Okay. Uh, the first slide, please. Uh, I can do it myself. There. Yeah. yeah, I can do it. No, I can. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very small, the the fonts. Uh, okay. Mm, before I found it, yes, and bring it and build on my lore, I ran my own company called JC Organics. And JC Organ has given me access to work with tens of thousands of uh, farmers and learn uh, two hard facts. Uh, the first one is that the younger average age of farmers in Indonesia is 50 years old, 54 years old, actually. And the second one is uh, more and more area farming is turned into dwellings. So the planting area became decreased and, and decreased. And uh, I feel that the, this, these two are the uh, major cause of the, uh, became the major cause of the food system collapsing in uh, Indonesia. With the knowledge I got working on the ground level with the farmers, I also realized that the young generations are getting more distance from the nature and their food source. Since the youth are the future, I was then encouraged to build uh, yes, and bring in an Omah Lord. So that's the, the reason why I built this uh, setup. When I built Omah Lord, I took into consideration all the local wisdoms and resources. That's why I built with bamboo, because it's uh, plentiful where I live. <clears throat> I designed every element at Omah Lord as an education tool. That said, when someone visits Omah Lord, just by walking around Omah Lord, they will learn something even without a formal class, as I believe that a classroom does not have to have walls. So Omah uh, holds a few short courses each year. The durations of the course is between one to two weeks. And I teach permaculture design course, ethno farming, organic farming, urban farming, and many courses related to farming and uh, uh, environment. Many of my students quit their jobs and become farmers after this course. Ray, who is now become my partner in the new company that I set up, has been working with over 1,000 farmers in the central Java. Yulinar uh, came as a timid, shy, 19 years old girl who ran away from home because she was uh, forced to marry to much older guy. Now she has become the leader of the Lagaligo Foundation in Sulawesi. June who used to work as a security guard in Jakarta despite the uh, high education, uh, had decided to went back home to Timor, and now he become uh, the village chief. That is to name a few of the ASN bringing alumni that has, uh, who has switched professions after spending time in Omar Lor. Uh, a few communities were also established all over Indonesia that were initiated by Omar Lor's alumni. Lagaligo in Luwu, Sulawesi, Maspete in Kufiyu, uh, Timo, and uh, Wokti Farm in Bogor, uh, Central Java, Kabun Kumara in Jakarta, and many more. The challenges I face managing Omahlor is that the village where Omahlor is located is very patriarchal. Uh, women is, uh, are never involved in any village decisions making. The villagers uh, consist of 90% seniors, so it's a bit difficult uh, for me to get them to, to work with us. And the local government seems to have their own political agendas that uh, makes all the politic, politi policies aim to support that agendas. 
So uh, that is hard for me to influence the locals in uh, around Omahlor. But that said, uh, Omahlor has a very big in impact outside our own community. Uh, uh, this is a few pictures of Omahlor uh, where all uh, we also have some volunteers come here come from all over Indonesia. They come to live for uh, up to six months. When they live in my place, it's not for free. They have to pay with labor. And at the end of the six months, they can have free course of their choice. So this is to educate them their economy doesn't have to have with money in it. So uh, it's something that uh, can uh, they can also uh, do in their own villages. <clears throat> Another thing that I learned from DC Organic is that when I visited a lot of these uh, tribes all over Indonesia, uh, they have already affected by modernization, so they forgot their roots. So uh, this is what I call reviving old wisdom. I'm going to give you an example of Maspete. Uh, Maspete is a a, a community in Timor that I worked with since 2013. So when I visited Kufeu in 2013, it's, uh, this matriarchal village was politically and morally discriminated by the government. Hardly any safe good roads going there, so I could only go by motorbike or for wheelers. Uh, they have no electricity either. Uh, despite the remoteness, the villagers rely their daily needs from outside supplies. And weavers bought imported yarns while they used to grow own cotton and make their own uh, make their own yarns. Farmers have uh, to buy seeds, fertilizers, pesticides because they were forced to change their eating habits. They used to eat corns and 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 uh, yams and uh, and a lot of roots. Now they are forced to eat rice. So this is something new. They are not familiar to plant rice, so they use a lot of heavy chemicals uh, on the rice. So they used to be independent, but not anymore. <clears throat> I came there at first to source for certain products as export, for export uh, produce, because that's my company, what company do. But I need to make them realize how rich they are and they should be proud of what they have. So to bring uh, back their pride, I need to involve them since the very beginning. Uh, of the community development process. This full involvement will make them understand their own potentials and problems. The first step was assessment. Uh, this is done by the local mothers under, the, under my guidance. They made questionnaires, visit homes one by one, input the acquired data, and put the data into readable numbers. Uh, the assessment includes social, cultural, natural potential, challenges, economical, and farming habits and, cult uh, and culture. So with this finding in numbers, the mamas then present their findings in front of the elders uh, and the government, the local government. Then they discuss together to tailor the best suited five years development programs for the community. Uh, the community agreed that their main product would be Moringa. So in 2016, the community was organic certified by EU, USA, and Japan standards. And uh, JC Organics brought their product to Biofar in 2017. Uh, there are huge demand from the European market. However, the community cannot comply with the quality standards and quantity. Uh, this is because of the lack of water and the lack of electricity to maintain the standards of uh, European and especially Japan. Uh, it has to be strictly with the proper warehousing. So, so we decided to switch the economy directions from export to keeping the economy within the community. Uh, we start training the mothers how to make oils out of the local plants, including Moringa, to make their own soap and their own uh, other uh, da daily products. Uh, we also train them to plant their own cotton and revive their yarn spinning skills to reduce the expense for cotton. Uh, we train them how to design edible garden around their yard so they will not spend any money to buy uh, food products. The season was excellent, worked very well. 
in 2018, they created a company called PT Mas PT Organic. Uh, this program is not only had community pride return, it had also upgraded the mama's knowledge and skills. With such confidence, now they have become trainers for other communities in the local economy. Uh, they also uh, have more income from weaving uh, because there is no expense on cotton, so there is more, more, more profit for them. And they don't have to be, because they don't have to bake cotton anymore. The, the children are so healthier now because they have fruits, even fish in the in the yards now. Uh, the challenges I faced working with the community with the, was the absence of electricity, clean water, and transportation, and the slash and burn. Uh, but we addressed the problem uh, by planting moringa uh, because after the assessment, uh, we find out that moringa is one of the sacred tree. So they, they cannot kill it. So we plan all over the, the, the yard so they will not do the slash and burn because they will kill Moringa. And it's not it's, it's not allowed. Uh, other than the above mentioned factors, cultural ceremonies and celebrations have also become a big challenge. If, if we want to export, it has certain deadlines and, and certain uh, timing that they have to meet, which is difficult with these uh, celebrations and ceremonies. This is the pictures of uh, the uh, the, uh, the uh, community with the the fish pond, with the uh, moringa production, the cotton productions, and also the veggies on the yard and uh, all the activities. Uh, the next one is uh, we talk about KS Ujati Rogo. It's a uh, it's a community who already has they already know the potential, but they don't know how to, what to do with it, or they cannot. Or make it in a maximum capacity. Uh, this this play, uh, this community is located in uh, in Yogyakarta. So Kaisitrogo was cooperative when I op when it uh, it, it was abandoned by their own one sole foreign buyer. Uh, the buyer still owes them like a lot of money and left uh, and difficult to be contacted. The community was devastated. They had lost trust, confidence, and hope. This is the situation when I met them the first time in 2010. They had about 400 members then. Uh, they were already certified organic when I first met them. In fact, this community was the one who introduced me to organic farming system. Jati Rogro produced about 400 metric ton coconut sugar per month in 2010. It was strange to me though that they never consumed their own products. They plan everything to uh, uh, in their farm to sell for money. There was lack of confidence in what they have. Uh, the first thing I did was to perform assessment for the community, like the first one, uh, like other community that I work with. Uh, the method of the assessment, of course, relied big time on their involvement. The findings showed them that uh, they have other many untapped potentials in their nature, culture, and community. With the knowledge from the assessment, they became more confident to upgrade their cooperative to the next level. It was easier for me to guide them to upgrade their products quality and capacity as well. We got our first client from South Africa in 2011. Our second client uh, came to same year from USA in 2014. Uh, sorry, in 2014, I took the product to Biofa in organic fair. Uh, in uh, in Germany, we got a few loyal, loyal clients from the fair. By 2016, our revenue gone up from uh, 400,000 US dollar per annum to, to 2 million US dollar per annum. Uh, other than the U to USA and South Africa, we also exported to Belgium, Germany, France, Portugal, UK, Holland, Australia, South Africa, mm -hmm. China, Mexico, Brazil, and many places. The community's life quality had improved significantly. That lured the farmers and children who work abroad to return home and become farmers. Uh, since women had minimum involvement in the cooperative, I separated the management of the cooperative and the business. The intent uh, intentionally installed women as the CEO and the managers of the, the business the man can work on the cooperative. 
one thing that I learned from this community, pre, uh, success brings new kind of challenges. The community has been in poverty for generations. The cooperative success had changed their life dramatically economic wise. Money was no longer an issue, but they found new toy, power. So they go into politics. <clears throat> so uh, that's uh, <coughs> the, the products that we uh, exported. And uh, that's the, the, some of the activities of the farmers in Jatirogo. So we, we, we also uh, teach them to uh, create no waste or produce no waste. So what the waste of one product can be source of a new product. Thus, we have the coconut fiber, we have the coconut uh, uh, charcoal. Uh, this is a byproduct that turned into something else. Now, the last one, we talk about Kaleka. Kaleka, Kaleka is, is about passing down legacy. I find, for me, uh, it's difficult for me to get someone who can work uh, you know, who carry on my work. So it is difficult. I've been looking for uh, young people to to pass down my skills and knowledge and work with other communities, but it's difficult. So I found out Kaleka just this year. Uh, when I started ASM being in Omaha, Lord, I never expected <clears throat> it would be so hard to find someone to take over both the foundation and education center. For the last six years, I've been monitoring quite a few young people to take over, but I never expect to be uh, like a painter who is who got framed in my own painting. Uh, my last uh, try was to mentor five, sorry, not five, uh, three, yeah, yeah, five, five young people to take over that I have been doing it, uh, doing on my own. Uh, it become another failure. So I tried to mentor five young people but it was a failure uh, because my method was wrong i involved them without any uh capital without any uh investment because i i use i, I give them the capital and everything uh but they run away after they got the knowledge and everything to get better uh jobs or whatever there isn't so i, did, I didn't get anyone to run omahlor and yes and bring in Learning from the past, the past fellows and learning from Xavier that the other communities leaders are having the same problem I'm facing now. I'm currently working on my last try to find successors who would manage the and bring in an Omar Lor. Out of hundreds of Yes and Bring alumni, I selected three young people for my partners. The goal is to mentor them to set up, manage, and upscale an international community-based trading company. Uh, some of the profit from the company would then use the STSR for Yes and Bring In. That way, both Yes and Bring In or Mahlor would have their funding without having to raise funds from other funders. So last August 24th, PT Kaleka Wana Nusantara was founded. Ray is one of the three partners. He used to work at university in Germany as a scientist mm -hmm. in regenerative energy. Then he got burned out and then came to Omahlor as a volunteer in 2018. In 2019, he joined one of my course. After the course, he then working with the rice farmers in his own village. During pandemic, he managed to get over 1,000 hectares of rice uh, rice fields cert uh, certified organic. He is very good in uh, working with the grassroots. Then I uh, asked Nafiti Putri, a female, to join. Nafiti is currently working with the, the International Labor Organization holding PhD in uh, community development. Her specialty is uh, conflict management, project development, and fundraising. Having, having her join the team was uh, would be very beneficial for both the company and the communities. Han Chandra is the last one to join the team. Han is the well-known model who is also a farmer. <clears throat> His farm, Kebun Ko Han, has been one of the most sought out uh, site visits for early education students. He sell, uh, the produce directly to customers as well as to stores and shops. His background in farming, education, and marketing is good skills uh, to have also for Kaleka. So far, I already took my partners to meet seven communities around uh, Java that used to work with me in the past with Joshi Organics. The challenges with this mentorship is that it's uh, 
overwhelmed for them with the new knowledge. So it's very slow. Things that I could do for like three days, they could do for two weeks. Uh, but it's necessary. They have to gain the knowledge if I want to pass on the the uh the knowledge. Uh, <clears throat> so with the with the works I have uh, been working. With all the works I've been working since 2005, I find that working with communities are fun and very rewarding. My only problem today is to find young generations that who would be willing to carry on the legacy. I hope Kalika would be the answer of that problem. Thank you all for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for this presentation, very concrete and uh, showing all the difficulties also to mm. manage differently the food uh, issues. Uh, so now we have a discussion, a panel discussion about all the presentations. Maybe uh, I could take five minutes to try to summarize what I understood from all the presentations and then uh, launch the debate do you is it okay for all of you it's not an easy thing to do because the uh, presentations were quite different but there are some uh, i think key points that we could uh, discuss about the first one is about social innovation as uh, xavier said it's a complex word uh, the term of innovation is a uh, uh, has a lot of meanings, especially in the economic world, and I'm not sure this is the more uh, adequate word to use, social innovation, but uh, this is the word which has been chosen. Um, but there was also in the title the idea of uh, change and transformation, and I think this is a very a key point, because uh, how do we impulse this kind of change? Meaning, do we stay in the same model? economic model and we just add some new things or do we change the model which are two different ways of thinking i think so for me the first point is really to discuss how do we manage the combination combination between social issues and economic issues because even if you all focused on social the importance of social dynamics you all, all of you refer to the access to the market as one key point also. So meaning that uh, economic cannot be distinguished from social and political issues. So maybe this is one of the key points of this discussion. Another point which is, seems to be very uh, important for me is the difference between uh, individual action and collective action because all of you uh, discussed about that. Um, there are individual interests and we cannot deny this, it exists. So even if we say we need collective action, we have some individual interest. And there are also some uh, key issues about what you said, we about um, uh, community leaders. Because community leaders, they are, they are individual, they are specific individual, and very often we can ask where does innovation come from? Who are the facilitators? Who decide that this is an innovation? Ajahn Chayan, you are a facilitator, but uh, what is your exact role? Dwi, you are also a facilitator, coming from another background, but you didn't mention your background, but I imagine that you come from a different background. So what is the role of these individuals in, uh, in the way they think about a different world? You, you talked about utopia, uh, Xavier, but uh, who is defining this utopia? So this is a second point which seems to be interesting. Another point, which is I'm a researcher. Uh, for me, I think we need a new paradigm. And uh, I think that uh, this new paradigm is very difficult to find out and to build because we need a new framework to think about all these innovations which are coming from the ground. So uh, 20 years ago in France, we were talking about uh, uh, solidarity economics as a new paradigm. And this disappeared slowly because uh, the market is always coming back. 
So meaning that even when you are talking about alternative utopia, the market is very strong and the market logics very often dominate at a certain time. So how do you deal with these issues? Okay, the issue is not about economy because we all need economy. The issue is what is the role of economy in our society? And this is very different way to think about it. You talked about local economy, you talked about local economy, but you also talked about getting access to international markets. So how do you combine this proximity with the opening to new uh, international areas with power relationships? You talked about China, for instance. Um, about, um, about one other point is about the narratives. It was very interesting to listen to you about uh, his uh, issues, but uh, uh, I don't know many things about this issue, but I know that there are different narratives about well, his problems and uh, different ways to address this problem. And the solutions are linked with the way you put the narrative on. So for instance, you talked about modernity and the impact on, of modernity on uh, his problems, which is very interesting, but it's one way of telling the story. And there are other ways. The other ways are to look to the way people live, not only people in big cities, but only how do people uh, get uh, involved in this discussion. And this is one of the very different uh, uh, difficulty. Uh, I have colleagues working on these issues in big cities in Africa, for instance, and they are trying to do a work with the people uh, at the local, really local places to see what they understand and how do they formulate this kind of problem of issue. So you need to have all the people get involved in the discussion, which is not easy. So it's for me, it's a, a, really an issue also. And I wanted to, uh, the last point is to, to discuss about, okay, we are talking about, in fact, environmental issues. I would say ecological issues, but uh, what does that mean? to think differently about the links between human being, non-human being, and nature. So this is a key issue also about all these stories, which is not easy also to do. And we don't have the framework, we don't have the logics to think differently about this issue. And I think that everything coming from the ground is very rich to go beyond. You, you talk, I, I don't like the term traditional and modernity because it's too dualism. It's, uh, it's for me, it's not the way to, to go beyond because when you are talking like this all the time, people say, oh, you want to go back to the ancient times, but it's not the, the idea. And there is a kind of melting combination between modernity and tradition. So I think that we need also to discuss about the words that we are using, tradition, modernity, innovation, market are these terms that we have to discuss more deeply. So I will stop. I don't want to talk too much, but I was a moderator. So I think not just to say, okay, please talk and please talk. <laughs> so now if you have uh, questions about all the presentations, uh, let's open the floor to the debate. Yes, uh, first, before we react on the different, very broad and uh, structural questions of Catherine, we should um, form the, the structure of uh, our exchanges today. Um, just a, a question for Dwi, because we had not the opportunity to, to make questions and answers. Um, regarding your background, you, you told me yesterday informally that uh, you have been trained in permaculture. Uh, could you say more about that and uh, how it has influenced the, the, the projects you are uh, ongoing? Um, and also, what is the network of uh, permaculture? How is it organized? Um, yeah, ju just this clarification. Thank you so much.
Uh, thank you, Gabriel. Actually, my background is a linguist. I'm a linguist by uh, by formal education. Uh, when I uh, when I work with farmers, I don't one hundred percent use permaculture. I usually look deep into their own uh, habit force and their own culture, and then implement what is best suited with that. You know, like mix uh, a few things. Like in Bau Bau, for example, now I'm working with uh, 400 farmers there. Uh, I'm not using permaculture. I'm using syntropic farming, which is totally com completely different things. It's like uh, uh, making a uh, food forest and also uh, uh, a cash crop at the same time. So uh, actually, I'm combining a lot of things when it comes to community. You have to go there and then... And then uh, talk to them, sit with them, and then see what is uh, uh, what is suitable for them. Not us deciding, but they decide. Because uh, this is what what I, I feel we should do. We, we go there and facilitate them to, to make that decision. Not us making the decision. Otherwise, they will not do it because they, either they don't know how to do it or uh, they feel it's just uh, rude to tell them what to do. Okay, and uh, about permaculture in Indonesia is spreading really, uh, really fast. And for permaculture itself, for me, is suitable for rural area, like in Jakarta, Depok, and this this area because they have very small amount of land. Uh, it's best suited over there because it's all about designing. You have to design your small amount of, of land to make the best out of it. You will not get everything, but you will get the best out of it, maximum, uh, with minimum input. And also, with the, uh, especially in the complex, uh, where, uh, housing complex with small amount of uh, open land, uh, for example, in Jakarta, I work with 2,000 uh, families where the uh, open land is only one meter by two meters. It's supposed to be for flowers only. But then uh, I told the mamas, you know, uh, two meters squared times 200 is 400 square meters. It becomes something. So we designed the whole village. Uh, we we uh, pay attention on the year round, which village got full sun, which village got shady area, who got, which one got uh, uh, only half sun, which part had only like very dark and because there is no sun at all because of mm -hmm. the other building. Based on that, we decide which kind of crops suitable for those areas. And then they can harvest like uh, together and then divide among each other. So this, I hope this answers your question. Are there some other questions for all the panelists? I, I just want to uh, ask you for <clears throat> clarification about uh, modern uh, modernity and traditional. I think, uh, yes, I agree that there's a kind of a, a duality on this. Uh, but at the same time, if you look at some example that all the speakers have mentioned, you find that uh, in the case of, for example, <clears throat> haze pollution, the the, <clears throat> the the those who are practicing shifting cultivation or those who collect mushroom in the forest or practice traditional uh, e e traditional way of life or depends upon the <clears throat> traditional economy are seen to be backward <clears throat> and that would promote the new kinds of uh, economic uh, new kind of agricultural production by saying that those shifting cultivators use the land inefficiently, right? Whereas the modern one, they can use, the, for example, lands on the hills, on the highlands, more productive by adding, by adding, uh, by using uh, uh, modern agriculture inputs like fertilizers and chemicals. Like uh, if you, in Doi Mesolong, for example, that where you visit, 
Uh, I remember since 1987, when we have this uh, uh, Thai German Highland Development Project in Daimesalong, or the Wavi, the farmers uh, who are practicing shipping cultivation have, are seen to be kind of a back, backward. They were encouraged to adopt new technologies like uh, fertilizer and chemical. And that's why in early 1990s, many Aka people, they left the village and go down to the city to involve in uh, uh, other kinds of activities. <clears throat> so um, what I would like to say, say is that, yes, uh, it's a dual concept, but at the same time, we, we also have to understand that this kind of narrative has paved the way for uh, the capitalists to penetrate into rural economy, right? And, and put these uh, uh, so-called traditional farmers as a victim, or even sometimes uh, they look at them as a, <clears throat> uh, we can, can call the criminalization of small farmers. Yeah. Those who burn the, the forest, for example, are seen as a criminal. So they have to be, but by by saying this, they do not understand the wisdom that or the knowledge that the local people have, you know. And this is why we the conflict between urban and rural, or uh, Bangkok and Chiang Rai, Chiang Mai, are still persists, right? That this kind of a power relation. Uh, <clears throat> uh, this kind of power relation uh, leads to, I would say, the the <clears throat> uh, blaming the poor rather than uh, understanding and make use and and provide some uh, space for them to participate in solving the problem of either haze or uh, <clears throat> commercialized agriculture in in northern Thailand, for example. Okay, um, so I have a uh, question for Professor Chayan uh, regarding the uh, Longan and yes. the Guanxi in uh, Lampun. Mm. And um, so my question is, uh, did in the end, did the uh, farmers or the people who grow the uh, Longan plantations, did they actually manage to overcome the issue of Guanxi in the area? No, they cannot. <laughs> they cannot. And uh, the Chinese uh, buyers are quite clever. You know, they, they have been able to... Uh, use the Guanxi system to cultivate a social relation among the Thai farmers. Some of them also uh, married to Thai women. The Thai women who uh, live in the village and through her network, kinship network, she can help buying longan or monopolizing longan buying at the village level. So uh, uh, sometimes the, uh, the, there is also collaboration between local Thai villagers and also Chinese buyer to set up uh, a kind of a <clears throat> buying system of the Longan. So at the end now, uh, the, the Longan trade is in always in the hands of Chinese uh, buyers, right? Uh, the, the the local Thai people cannot uh, compete with them. Okay, right. that's why the, the <clears throat> farmers in Lampun try to develop this kind of organic farming, not only growing along again, but going in other kind of crops. So in other words, they do not depend upon monocropping. They would still grow along again, but organic ones and also other organic vegetable. Okay. To, in order to to uh, <clears throat> be able to more or less like survive in this era, in this era of uh, neoliberalism.
So, uh, Doctor Ajahn Chaya, yes, uh, uh, is kind of interesting that the monopoly always can uh formed by the sellers, not the buyers. But in this case, uh, the the long yen trading is kind of like the buyer monopoly. But why the farmers do not sell their products to other buyers? Why they only choose the Chinese buyers? That is what I'm concerned about. Uh, they have to now try to sell the organic long yen to uh, local uh, companies for for long for organic long yen product. But in general, the local farmers, even though they may have connection with some buyers, Thai buyers, they cannot compete with the the system of the Chinese buyers. So through their system, they know they control the price. So if you are a local farmers who would like to sell your long and go to the first one, they'll quote the, the price for uh, this amount. And then to another one, they we, they also share the same price. So local farmers cannot uh, have to be they have to sell it in other words to these uh, Chinese uh, Chinese buyers. <clears throat> and more than that, uh, the Chinese farmers or uh, buyers also um, on control logistic system, and also being able to bring longans to China. Uh, within two or three days right? because of that they know the system of each province in china in china i what i understand is that each province has its own ways of uh, uh, collecting tax so if you bring long into certain province you have to clear the tax first but in certain province they're not the same right? so the uh, thai uh, farmers uh, do not have that capacity to bring long and to sell it in Yunnan market or uh, 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 to to the uh, <clears throat> big city in, in big city in in China. Right? Yeah. So uh, they cannot compete with them. Yeah. I think the same is in Durin in 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 Chantaburi, Chonburi. Now it's in the hands of the the uh, Chinese buyers. <clears throat> in, in Thai, we call Long Jin. You know, you heard about that? Um, um, I have a question to to you get home <laughs> and to other people. Um, when we, you talk about a new paradigm and when we uh, look at different experiences here, um, whether you or you, and um, are we looking for um, uh, a paradigm which is beyond what we talked before about social and solidarity economy? Uh, which is a system which uh, tries to combine uh, um, the local economy and uh, capitalistic economy in uh, in a kind of a sustainable way. I mean, acceptable approach, like uh, Dewey is trying to do by uh, connecting the global market with those uh, farmers. And uh, are we now? opening a new era of uh, economy that will be uh, uh, beyond this uh, way we thought before? <laughs> hmm. Difficult. <laughs> um, at the beginning, in, it's in France, huh? but at the beginning, solidarity economic was um, a discourse to criticize the impact of neoliberalism. So it was an alternative. It was not a combination, be, combination between local economy and capitalist uh, model. It was clearly uh, something which was outside the capitalist model and against neoliberalism. 
That was the discourse and all the initiatives in France, as the one you mentioned here, or in your case, were political, there was all a political discourse. And you know, uh, Ajahn Chayan, you, when you said um, that they were organized as a network, and then you said as a social movement, that was the aim in France, to create a social movement to give another discourse about the um, economic development, in fact. So, but slowly, yeah. uh, the market is very powerful, as I told you, and as the neoliberalism is very strong for, um, the, this dimension, this critical dimension, get uh, lower and lower in these experiences. So now in solidarity economic, we are talking about hybridization between the logics of market, state, and civil society. But when you have this kind of hybridization, the issue is what is the power relationships between these three dynamics? And uh, when you are talking about ecological issues and all this, the idea is, you know, as in public-private partnership, it's exactly the same. What is the more powerful? In, in PPP, the issue, me, I've been working a lot on PPP in the water issues. Um, and what you see all the time is that because of the nature of the contract between the public and the private actors, they don't have all the same information. They don't have the same capacity to understand the contract. They don't have the same power, especially when you are talking about big, big PPP. So very often the public yeah. or people dimension is the one which is, uh, you know, not the one which has the power, in fact. So I think it's very interesting to analyze all these experiences through this lens and to see what is the political dimension of this and how it can survive to create experiences for thinking differently, new models and all this. That's why I think Taiban research is very interesting. It's a new way of uh, not only collecting data, but analyzing also the situation and maybe trying to gather people all around the world, not only in Asia, because there are also experiences in Africa, in South America, everywhere. So to try to create this kind of network to share different ways of thinking. Because as you said, when we are numerous, we are stronger. And we can show that there are alternative ways of thinking, not only of doing things. That's what I think, but well, I don't know if I answer your question. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, I want to share my experience, similar experience with Professor Tayan in Indonesia. Uh, it's uh, when, when you talk about longan in my community, we talk about coconut sugar. We had the same experience. There are a lot of uh, agents in between. Uh, before we export the product. And that's become a big problem because the agents politically, they, they hold everything and socially and strategically, they have everything. Uh, uh, different communities that I uh, I'm, I was working with, they they uh, they have different, different way to address this. In Duk Jakarta, uh, the way I address is to involve them. Instead of seeing them as a, as a enemy, we involve them because it's easier that way. So they become one of the, the, the cooperative. They become part of the cooperative. Uh, this is one way of doing uh, uh, to solve the problem. The other part is that because we cannot compete with them, uh, instead of uh, earning economy only from one product, we diverse it. So we cut down a few trees and then plant other things. So, so they, they they control the price of coconut sugar, but, but they, they also have cloves, they also have cardamom, they also have ginger, they also have everything. You know, once they, they got the economy from these other stuff, these other products, then they they, they, they have the power to to decline for 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 the uh, agents to buy the coconut sugar. No, I don't wanna sell my 
uh, my sugar to you anymore because I have other products. I, I choose to wait until I have a better offer because they already, already have other economic. This is uh, two ways that I use uh, when I face that kind of problems. For the first one, when you involve them to be part of the cooperative, is it will involve a lot of talk and politically you know, talking with the with these agents, it takes a lot of time also. And also sometimes they will come to my office with a big mass city and threaten you. But that's part of the dynamic. And uh, it's uh, it's doable in Indonesia. But I don't know about the culture in uh, in Thailand. But uh, this is the two ways that I use for this kind of problem. Thank you. Yeah, yeah you go first. This one is to quite short. Oh, for me? Anyone? You, anyone? Yeah. Just hey, anyone? You want to beg? Well, I had a reaction if nobody uh, has a other reaction. Because the fact that uh, across the different presentations, uh, there were uh, an emphasis on um, the peasants, the producers, uh, the local communities, and on the other side, on the market, the buyers. Um, and uh, something was left, it was the public authorities between them, and how do they regulate or uh, take over the projects of the peasants or uh, consult the peasants, uh, how do they organize the market and so on. So um, if, I, if I think about my home country, which is the Basque country, uh, four provinces in Spain, three provinces in France, there has been a social struggle for 120 years, 40 now, but in the two last decades, it has been pacified and people have been able to organize through unions, cooperatives of peasants particularly, but also of uh, industrial producers. And uh, they have also political parties, political forces, social movements, and they have been able to secure market for the local producers, uh, which are regulated by the public authorities. So for instance, uh, the peasants will have their products bought by uh, the canteens of the schools, of the hospitals, of uh, the police, and so on. Uh, so they know how they have to produce, in what quantity, what kind of products, and so on. This is for the short circuit local markets, for more niche markets like uh, local paper, espelet paper, which can be exported, but they try to, to privilege short circuits uh, across the national uh, uh, milieu. They will uh, have uh, another kind of, of organization, but also based on the cooperative. So they have been uh, successfully uh, able to, uh, to work with the public authorities and to alert the public authorities. And of course, in Thailand or in Indonesia, the context is very much more different. So my question would be across your different research and uh, practical initiatives. Have you been able to see success uh, stories uh, to work with the public authorities to regulate the, the market and to enable the peasant to secure their uh, sales and uh, to have a more sustainable production. Uh, Gabriel, can I just add something? Yes. Uh, before being an uh, economic uh, you know, success story, it was a political movement. 140 uh, 40 yeah. years so of So it was a political issues bef before sure. uh, being organized at the economic level, which is quite different for me. It's because it was a political mm. movement at the beginning that it was successful to with some violence also at some times to to defend another model they have their own money they have it it goes very far in the and and it's political before being economic for me yes yes and the great intelligence of dui is uh, to to work on social development but not only to count on social movement because mm. in indonesia social yeah. movement they go and they That's disappear why it's recontextualized. sorry can I add? Uh, I I totally agree with you, Gabriel. Because uh, in in if if we involve the government, the policies that they, they we can we can influence their policies to to support our 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 uh, project and it moves really fast. And uh, but it's difficult to convince them sometimes. 
uh, I work with a few governments before, especially in Timor, because they want their uh their projects to be seen by the 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 uh the by Jakarta. So it is easier if yeah I agree with the with if we work with the local government and uh, because they have the funding, they have all the tools, they have the infrastructure, everything. And uh, for me, it is difficult. For, for for my own experience to to convince them though at, unless we answer to the, their own needs you know and sometimes their needs is what uh, is just, uh, the the commodity doesn't need it so it's like the opposite yeah uh that's that's our problem in indonesia if we, if we uh, talk about government's support that's why i rarely involve them unless they come to me when they come to me then we negotiate you know, like uh, for example, in in uh, uh, where is it in Yogyakarta the first time when I, I I wanted to get them certified organic, it costs a lot of money because it's like two thousand families, and uh, I make a proposal to the government to finance that, and they they didn't even look at it, you know, and then I <clears throat> I talked to the uh, buyer, look, you need the certif certification, not us, come here. We sign a contract, uh, paste the decade from from the invoice every every month if you must, but we don't need the we don't have the money for that. So they finance the first uh, certification for for the, the community. Like uh, once we export it, like uh, two years later, it was election time. Then they started to look at, you know look us as a source of vote, and then this is the negotiation negotiation time for us. This is the only time we. We can we can negotiate with farmers when there is an election or when they come to us for whatever reason, then we can negotiate. Otherwise, I think it's just a waste of time. Thank you. Is there anything to expect from the the Partei Solidaritas Indonesia from the the son of Jokowi, or is it only a label? <laughs> because I see he is going to do an, an alliance with uh, Prabowo Subianto, who was the the former head of. Uh, uh, Ashkatei, which was very neoliberal uh, vision of agriculture in Indonesia as well. I never vote, so I don't know. Yeah, there is a question. Um, oh, sorry. Just uh, want to touch upon a very short on the idea of social innovations. Uh, it's related very much what we are talking about, the shift of the paradigms, the transformations of um, economic spheres, political spheres, and cultural socioeconomic sphere. The idea is that the social innovation currently should serve as the new approach to match between the upper dog and underdog, and in the same time, to create something what's so called coexistence the balance, you know, and that is the idea that if we want to have peace, we should have sustainabilities. If we want to have sustainabilities, we must have peace. And right at the beginning, you mentioned about different people have different idea, whatsoever, it's positions, and this is incompatibilities. If we see incompatibilities as, as, diversities not different and we put incompatibilities which become incompatible goals incompatible positions and we put in the box and we shake it we embrace the difference and transform it as diversities and we bring it out after we bring it out we can see that there's a progress there is a process there is positivities there is opportunities we can transform insecurities to securities in political spheres, for environmental issues, participations, democracies, all these things can be put under the big terms of social innovations. But what kind of social innovation we need? Who will be part of that? How long would it need? Uh, which phase do we design? That's why social innovation should not be just only a, a knowledge or paradigm, but it should bring to a concrete solutions or something. It should not be just only for the words that what need to be done in every stage. 
in every academic uh, meeting, but it should transform to be actions. So that's my idea of social innovations. Yeah. Oh, I think that uh, co-production of knowledge is action, in fact, really. Um, but when you, sorry, can I just add something? When when you say that, you just, for me, huh, you you just avoid talking about power relationships. But I'm so sorry. I, I would like to have a wonderful world with cooperation, collaboration, and the peace everywhere. Unfortunately, I think that uh, uh, in our societies, it's not the case. So when you avoid talking about power relationships, when you avoid to just focus on what are in this community, also in communities, you know, we talk about community, 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 but inside communities, you have this kind of power relationships. So it, for me, it's very important to just say that and identify this and not consider that solidarity is a very wonderful world where everything is peaceful and all this, because in the real life, it's not the situation, unfortunately. So, okay, I have one question. There is one question from the, um... merci, thank you, <laughs> discussion. Um, this is a question for Ajahn Chayan, maybe. Uh, so I believe there is a critically, criticality for the need of research for agrarian community and perishable produce exports to China, which is completely in hegemony. Longan story is the same as melons and banana producer crisis in Myanmar, which is being neglected issue. Thanks, uh, Arjan, for the interesting story. But I don't know what is the question. <laughs> and there's another question. What strategy to promote the Marungi in Kufeu sub-district to more famous? Oh, this is for you. Yeah. What strategy to promote? This uh, Moringa. Oh. Uh, for, for Moringa, uh, Moringa is a very rich plant. It, uh, when I when I run it in the lab, it has so so much minerals that it's so good. You don't need to have supplements. Just eat moringa. But if you eat too much, it's not very really good also for your body. So you have to eat it in moderate. So this only can uh, intrigue people to to consume it. And in uh, in Kufeu, the moringa was planted not only to to avoid slash and burn, but also to address a stunting problem over there for, in the children. Because of these uh, rich minerals in, in Moringa, it helps the, the kids to get better uh, nutrition for the food, uh, for, for their body and, and preventing stunting. Uh, so that's how we do it. And then be, be, in Kufeu, because it's difficult for me to export then because of the uh, power and water problem. Uh, so we keep the economy inside. And besides, other than Kufeu, the other villages also have the same problem. They have the same stunted kids. They have the same, exactly the same problems. So they, uh, I, um, I train them to plan for their own food first. Whatever is excess, that's the one that they sell. They don't, they don't produce to sell. They produce to consume. And then whatever excess, then we educate them how to preserve it, how to, to keep it inside and then uh, sell it outside later, how to add the value. So instead of just selling Moringa, dried Moringa, they sell like uh, Moringa soap, Moringa snack, <clears throat> Moringa tea, uh, to add the value and keep the economy within the villages itself. Because... Uh, the challenges is not only water and, and, and power, but also the transport. To transport Moringa outside the village costs a lot of money. And it will not become uh, competitive anymore with the other competitors, let alone to send to Java. So that's why we don't uh, encourage the locals to sell it 
outside their own village. They just keep it inside and their neighboring, which don't have Moringa. So that's the answer. I, I would repeat my, my big question, but uh, to Ajahn Chayan, when you have um, um, piloted the different, uh, when, you are, when you have um, conducted the different uh, field work through the Taiban approach, have you been able to reach the public authorities? And uh, if yes, was it through institutional mechanisms or interpersonal connection? How does it function in Thailand and in your particular case? Um, in in the case of Taiban research, when when we conducted uh, with the people who against them in the northeastern part of Thailand, we also work with the assembly of the poor. So the research or knowledge production is part of the social movements against them during that time. But uh, in the case of the Longan situation in Lampun, I did not work with the uh, farmers directly, but I, I just learned from their experience in using what they call community-based research to, to obtain knowledge so that they, so that they can uh, choose to interact with the market selectively. They don't, they don't deny the market, but they participate in the market, but selectively, meaning that they have their own position. And also, they also try to learn how to improve the quality of their products so that they can sell it to EU market. Right? But the long-end farmers, the organic long-end farmers, they do not uh, join the assembly of the poor or those who are who are involved in the social movement in northern northern part of Thailand. So their activities is quite limited, right? not, not part of the political movement uh, of the uh, poor farmers vis-a-vis -vis market economy or the policies with regard to with regard to development. So in other words, my comment is that they their movement should can be enhanced or can be improved if they use this organic farming as a social movement, bringing uh, connecting with uh, middle class people in in urban Lampun or Chiang Mai, as well as connecting with the uh, NGO who are supporting the assembly of the poor. Also, what is interesting in the case study, to answer your question, but to address your question, not answer, <laughs> it's that, uh, as you explained, uh, Ajahn Chayan, some of the research was funded by the Thai Research Fund, yes. which is a connection with public authority yes. in one way, because they were asking you to find a kind of methodology to uh, address the issues at the local level. Yes. So it's one of the, for me, it was very interesting when you explained this, because it's one of the connection with the public authorities also, no, Gabriel? But the, the, uh, the, the research supported by Thai Research Fund aimed to, aim for the villages, villages to work more or less like inclusively, inclusively within their own village, right? They do not look at the larger context, yes. political context. Mm -hmm. But that's it's why a my, demand from the public. Yeah, but that's why my 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 comments towards this methodology is not this not they don't this methodology doesn't allow the farmers to critically look at the larger con structure, political structure. Yeah. Political, economic, and environmental structure. Yeah. It's uh, it's interesting comparatively because uh, we could uh, we could think about uh, what is the vision of uh, the, the the Thai uh, authorities and the Indonesian authorities regarding the role of science, 
Uh, last week, I was invited to, to to give a talk to the conference of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Indonesia on the golden vision of Indonesia 2045, where they, cle they clearly mentioned that the role of uh, scientists mm -hmm. and uh, the higher uh, education sector should be to work together with the government and with the industry to develop uh, Indonesia in economic ways. So it is very, um, very specific way of seeing what is higher education and research. Yeah, but in Indonesia, the water law was uh, canceled because of the um, activist movements for the right to water also. So the impact of local community getting organized against privatization of water in Indonesia you know, led to the cancellation of the law, which was a big event also. So depending on the sector also, I think. Just to mention before leaving that Flavi uh, alerted us that uh, there has been uh, the publication of uh, a paper uh, from Irasek in 2013 from Narat uh, Masashu and uh, Hasashu and Par Pataraporn Kalaya, competitiveness of local agriculture, the case of long and fruit trade between China and the north of Thailand. <laughs> so, prefiguration. Good afternoon, um, distinguished participants of the workshop. Um, this is um, the introduction of session four, five, and six. Uh, my name is Chalong Rajaransi from School of Social Innovation, as Sajan Prabhi mentioned. Uh, I will serve as a moderator for this afternoon session. Um, well, um, this afternoon will be divided into uh, session four, session five, and session six. Um, the session four will be uh, the presentation from uh, two schools in our university. The first one is from the School of Sinology, uh, will be presented by uh, Ajahn Chaiunke and Ajahn uh, Simon Michael Jones on the role and challenges of Lanshang Mekong cooperation in the desecuritization of water resources in the Mekong River Basin. And the other will be from the School of Management, uh, presented by Assistant Professor Dr. Apisom Intralawan on nature-based solutions for water governance. Um, the first 20 minutes will be for uh, Sinology, and then uh, the rest will be for uh, management. Uh, but uh, for those who may have a question uh, or a point to discussion with the, the presenters, uh, I would like to give the priority for uh, Dr. Apison, first, because he is going to leave at three. So uh, if you have a question for, for this paper, uh, please uh, raise your hand and introduce yourself, then ask him. So he might have a time to discuss with you. So uh, in order to save your time, I would like to pass the microphone to uh, the first presentation. Um, please welcome Ajahn Jai Minkerkhap. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Nichan for inviting us to this uh, workshop. Uh, my name is Jai Yun Ke, come from uh, School of Sinology, Maifa Luang University. So let's begin. Uh, our topic is the role and challenges of Lanzang Mekong River Corp Corporation in the desecretization of uh, water resource in Mekong River Basin. So. First of all is the securitization of water resource. The securitization theory is first uh, mentioned by Barry Busan and Ole Weaver in 1990s after the Cold War. And it is simple to understand because it's more like the government put a normal issue into a national security issue. That is the securitization. And let's talk about the water. The water is the origin of life and water makes everything, including us as a humankind. So uh, the water resource can influence economic development, uh, food security, and uh, transportations. 
And for example, the conflicts in the Nile River Basin among the Egypt, Sudan, and Ethiopia, and the Six-Day War between the Arabic nations and Israel, which focus on the owning of the Jordan River, and also the war in Kashmir between India and Pakistan that uh, influenced by the I, uh, IWT. And water security has become a popular trend in the world, even for James Bond. Like quant uh, Quantum of Solace, the evil organizations threaten downstream areas by controlling Bolivar's water resources. But we have to admit that uh, the, the water resource still needs a balance. So too little uh, can make our world into the Mad Max and too, too much can make our world into the water world. So next part, we are talking about the securitization of Mekong River. After the end of Cold War, the development of resources in Mekong River Basin exhibited uh, two major trends. The first, there was a great uh, gradual increase in the scale of development among the mainstream. And second, private developers began to take the lead in development and construction. So uh, in this condition, uh, the international river systems, conflicts are more likely to arise between upstream and downstream. And rather than between countries on the same side of the river, this helps us to explain the culture's attitude for Vietnam and Cambodia towards China, Laos, and Thailand for the hydropower dam constructions and even the outbreaks of conflicts. And due to a varying national interests, different countries have different attitudes towards the development of hydropower resources in Mekong River resulting in the uh, varying degrees of securitization of Mekong River water resources. So we can see like Thailand, Thailand concentrating more on the water resource and electricity resource to uh, make people live a happier life and to uh, uh, strengthen their economic uh, development. And the, uh, the Laos, the Laos, as a, one of the poorest country in economic in the world. So Laos is highly possi possible to sell their uh, hydro resource in uh, just to sell the electricity, turning them into money. So they are going to build many uh, hydro hydropower dams with China or by China. And then the uh, Cambodia, Cambodia concentrating more on the ecological security of Tonle Sap Lake for the fresh water fish. Because according to the UN, uh, the Cambodia, the, the, the protein uh, of Cambodia people, like more than 40% is come from the uh, fresh water fish. So they highly concentrating on the ecological security of Tonle Sap Lake. And the last one is Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam is the uh, ending of the Mekong River and they highly concentrating on the uh, solidization in the Mekong Delta. So these all issues makes the water resource, like water problem, into a national security problem by the securitization of the government uh, governments. And next one is what does China do? So uh, November 2014, during the 17th China ASEAN summit, former Chinese Premier Li Keqiang proposed uh, the Lantang Mekong Corporation, uh, we know as LMC. And after one year, the LMC was formally established and the, the 
uh, LMC uh, has five priorities like connectivities. Connectivities is to enhance border transportation options. Uh, the most important thing is the, the railways construct, uh, construction between China to Laos and even now Laos to Thailand, like uh, Kunming to Vientiane and Vientiane to Bangkok. Uh, that's a railway construction. And also the land and water linking between China and Myanmar. And one of the uh, one of the priori uh, one of the important thing is the uh, criminal uh, like to against criminal between China, Myanmar, Thailand, and Laos. And next one is the uh, uh, the production production cap uh, capacity cooperation, like to transporting steel, cement, electricity, transportations, uh, shipbuilding, and other sections, and the cross-border economic cooperation, like the construction of cross-border economic zones and industrial parks uh, within the framework. When we go to the Golden Triangle, we can see across the uh, Mekong River, we can see the, the park in Laos that they build a economic zone by China. And next one is the uh, water resources cooperation, like building a cooperation center for Lanchang Mekong River water resources, uh, use of water resources and strengthening flood control and disasters relief measures. So last one is to, uh, oh, Last one is agriculture. Uh, last one is agriculture. The uh, agriculture and poverty reduction. So China does these things like they are very delightful to using cooperation instead of conflicts and using dialogue to create a platform to communications. But why China do, do this? Uh, why does China do this? This all becomes the 20, 2010, the big, uh, the, the huge disaster of the, uh, of the, wait, sorry, <laughs> I missed it. Oh, it, like the Mekong River crisis in 2010. The scholars, media, and environmental organizations in countries like Thailand and Vietnam and Cambodia, like they, they pointed out that China has built dams on the Lanchang River in the upper Mekong. So leading to water diversion for hydro power generation, which has caused the Mekong River's water levels to drop to the lowest in half a century. But China has rapidly denied uh, these claims. So what further concerns the countries from Mekong River Basin is that China was neither a member of Mekong River Commission, uh, IMRC, uh, IMRC, which has been established for 15 years at that time, nor China signed the agreement. So it can be said that uh, the current Mekong River crisis has promoted China to establish its own cooperative uh, mechanism to de security uh, to de security the the uh, issues in the Mekong River Basin. And on the other hand, on the other hand, so the ongoing conflicts with uh, Western countries, China really needs to build a positive national image in Southeast Asia. Uh, this is also one of the important reasons why China is investing in and building in, in infrastructure in the Lantang Mekong Corporation region without expecting uh, returns. And next we will next we will talk about the challenges by my colleague Simon Michael Jones.
Okay, so I think it's important to restate the significance of this, and that is, this is more from a macro perspective about the relationship between China and the neighboring countries down the river. And um, so uh, a, a key issue was asking the question, why does everybody come to the table? So first of all, um, China has the initiative in being able to control the water upstream. And um, in a sense, it's a give and take relationship because China uh, brings people to the table and also uh, in some sense also invests in the local areas as well with their projects. And um, it's arguable whether or not this is good or bad, and uh, there are many details to talk of and uh, to to talk about there. But um, basically, the uh, this is a process of desecuritization, and I would argue that it is productive to cooperation between countries because, um, at the very least, there's a place where people can speak, and that is a the let's say a key factor in being able to negotiate uh, from the micro perspective in the future. So um, that's, uh, that's, let's say an overview of uh, this position here. Now, oh, sorry, thank you. Uh, I'm not leader. Oh. So there are certain problems which, um, let's say, are a arise as a result, and um, it's also important to state the threats to any future cooperation between uh, the countries. And so um, each country will have its, uh, let's say, there will be specifics connected with each country. And so in China's case, they have been, uh, uh, China often promotes the use of soft power. China imports a lot of rice from these uh, countries further down the region. And uh, as of 2022, they imported 6.194 million tons of rice. And um, so the main importing countries are India, Pakistan, Thailand, Myanmar, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Japan. All uh, most of which are from the uh, Mekong subregion, and um, Myanmar is uh, has gradually attached more importance uh, to uh, sustainable development of resource uh, water resources, uh, emphasizing the need to uh, cooperate. And so Myanmar is primarily concerned uh, about how to control damage from flooding. Yeah. And uh, Laos uh, needs to, uh, so Laos interests lie in uh, project support and capacity building. So uh, hydropower is uh, one of the, uh, the, the, the key things with Laos. And um, they often rely on investments from China as well to create the uh, necessary infrastructure for this. And so there are, there are multiple uh, issues connected with the development of said uh, infrastructure. Infrastructure. Thailand is a relatively upstream uh, country, and so um, out of all the members, Thailand probably has the uh, the least incentive, arguably, to uh, to reach a sharing agreement, and. Um, so the uh, Thailand needs to be careful about. Uh, there are some dam construction projects, and so Thailand does need to be careful of how they influence the water flow downstream towards Vietnam and Cam Cambodia. And uh, Cambodia's uh, position is similar to uh, Vietnam in that they are the last two countries who share this resource, and um, they are located to the uh, lower reach. And uh, Cambodia, as Ajahn Zai mentioned, uh, the Tonle Sap Lake is extremely important to them as they rely on it heavily for food consumption, mainly protein from fish. And so uh, that is uh, there's there. And um, Vietnam is perhaps affected the most by uh, all of this because they are the last country in the whole chain of countries. 
And um, being next to the mouth, uh, they also risk uh, salination of water. So when the water upstream decreases, the sea level moves in, and then it also affects how uh, the capacity to create and generate agriculture in the area. So, um, and um, next are some, uh, So the next threat is, uh, as I say, uh, each country has their agendas and um, the peculiarities of the situation about how they face, uh, what is their relationship to the Mekong River. And um, so there are some countries who are involved in the dispute in the South China Sea as well. And um, there, there's a water threat theory that states that um, perhaps this uh, securitization and desecuritization relationship could uh, develop into a, uh, a conflict on the same scale as the South China Sea dispute. As uh, some of the membrane countries here, they uh, also share the uh, dispute with China through the South China Sea. So um, after the launch of the uh, Lantang uh, Mekong cooperation in 2016, countries outside the region, such as the United States, Japan, um, they also share a stake in the issues here, as some of these countries have also invested in energy along the river as well. And so they, uh, these countries will have to protect their assets, of course. And so that's why they are part of uh, the group of stakeholders in this issue. So um, that's the uh, general perspective, but um, we also look, need to look forward in a sense to the future of what kind of possibilities lie ahead here. And uh, like I said, I think I, I fully support a platform where people can come to negotiate. Uh, however, there are, there are hidden conflicts along the way and that will pose a threat. And um, most recently, what worries me is that uh, China's uh, economic stability uh, caused partly due to the uh, real estate sector in China and the difficulties over there. And um, the thing is, ultimately, when a country needs to allocate their resources, they will always have to choose domestic over international in almost all cases. And so projects like B, uh, BRI, LMC, the Lanchang Mekong Cooperation, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, I, th I think um, there's a potential of side effects due to economic instability that uh, less support will be brought to these initiatives to support a, uh, you know, an exchange, a platform of exchange between uh, countries involved in this conflict. And so uh, that's all for our talk. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for uh, the presentation on uh, desecuritization. And then... Uh... We will go shortly to uh, Ajahn Afisom's presentation on nature-based solution for water governance. Um, again, uh, if you have any question or point to discussion with the presenter, presenter yes. Yes, I have a question. Since uh, the access to resource and to water resources is a major concern for local communities as well. It's not just a national issue uh, in all these countries you're speaking about. So uh, I would like to uh, have your insights regarding the, to what extent are the uh, local communities involved in management of water resources and in the designing the national policies and the policy uh, built up by uh, Lanchang Mekong uh, Corporation.
uh, that, that's what we are concerning about as as well because you know the LMC is established by the all the governments and the the I I could say that the, the six government are not traditional um, like like democratic countries so that's the country interest can be half the people's interests uh, is what we concern as well. But we, we didn't do any research yet. Uh, I, I think it's a good a good proposal for, for the future research. And we, we would like to do that uh, in, in next step. Thanks for asking. So the, to um, you know recap on all of that, I also agree with that that uh, and and thank you again for raising the issue. I think the relationship between the government and the people in the area is uh, a secondary uh, priority when when negotiating, and it's mainly concerned with government to government negotiations. Thank you. Yeah. Um. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we will go to Ajahn Abhisom's presentation shortly. So if you have any question, please stay for for uh, the other session. Okay, uh, Ajahn Abhisom, please. Okay, uh, thank you again for the invitation. And good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, well, um, thank you for the first presentation as well about the Mekong River Basin. Um, uh, the first presentation uh, using a country analysis, and I'm going to transcend and talking about human and nature relationships. So I'm not talking in particular countries. And I think this is somewhat uh, innovative because uh, you know uh, these new paradigms you know uh, will help uh, transform the human nature relationship. Okay, so nature-based solutions for water governance. So um, NBS is the action to protect, manage, and restore natural and modify ecosystem, which address societal challenges. This morning we heard about societal challenges, you know, effectively and adaptively providing human well-being and biodiversity benefits. Um, well, what we are facing now, are we having a shortage of electricity? Are we having a problem of climate change? Are we having a social and economic development? You know, it's a very complex issue. And um, nature-based solutions is one of many solutions that having a co-benefit by being a nature-based solutions, uh, this is a broad term, you know, but uh, it's, it's uh, divided into many things on the upper right-hand side, like for example, ecological restoration, ecological engineering, uh, forest landscape restoration, green infrastructure, something like that. Now, the, the reason why we have to adopt this new uh, concepts is because the conventional practices or approach basically using engineering, uh, especially water resource or civil engineering, using concrete to fight with the floods are no, no longer working. And the uh, right uh, upper down corner uh, picture uh, illustrate very well. I, uh, in 2019, for example, we have dams in the Mekong River, but we don't have water to generate electricity. You know, engineer can build dams, but engineer have difficulty to build rain at the moment, okay? So that's why um, we need a new way of thinking, a new way of uh, uh, um, coexisting with nature. Uh, example of uh, NBS, you know, uh, many example, uh, it started, it's a, a social movement started in, 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 in more developed countries who, who experienced the negative impacts of developments. Uh, for example, in LA on the upper left corner, you can see that the right picture here is uh, 
uh, uh, a canal, you know, like they pave all of the river, you know, trying to um, uh, irrigate the farmland in California. But, um, you know, the more they pave, the, the more problem, ecological problem uh, occur. So uh, LA people are starting to think like, oh, this approach might not get us, get us very far. So they now are uh, uh, removing all of the concrete and restoring the river that's on the left-hand side. On the upper right-hand side, that is in Netherlands uh, as well. They start rewinding all of the river into the original states. Uh, upper left is, uh, uh, lower left is in Australia. They are also having a rewinding our flood plains. And on the right is a Chongke Chon stream. Many people may have heard about it. You know, like 30 years ago in Korea, uh, people may value transportation and they fill up the canal and build the uh, expressway. But um, so uh, increasingly facing with floods because there is a, Concrete, it's not porous. You know, it's it's uh, water cannot go through. So when they experience uh, uh, heavy rains, the the country often floods. So they're now removing all of the um, expressway and restore the canal and the the creeks. And that creek become a, a, a monkey cheek or the buffer zone when the water come. And it's also uh, help in terms of. Uh, 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 air pollution and become a recreational uh, uh, place for Korean people. Yeah, uh, now back into the regions, uh, you know, this uh, ecosystem uh, based adaptation or NBS has long been practiced by our natives and indigenous, and indigenous people, you know, like on the upper left, uh, you can see that it's a house in Tolesap. You know, people learn how to live with the floods. You know, they're not trying to against the floods or control the water, but they live with the floods. So that's why they built the house very high in Tolesa when the flood come. Flood sometimes not 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 always bring the negative uh, uh, impacts. Flood also bring fish and sediments and generate lots of incomes. On the upper right corners, this is a Thailand example. We are trying to um, do is doing this uh, like the Kok Nong Na model and looking at the whole um, water check as one unit of the of the uh, analysis. You know, so this is talking about the from the from the ridge to the rift. So if you want to manage this uh, ecosystem, you have to look holistically. So uh, the project would come from like restoration of the upland forest area, you know, a uh, couple reservoir up here and then down to the flood plains, uh, including the restoration of wetland area. Um, on left here, you can see lots of uh, example uh, elsewhere in, uh, this is a Chula Longkorn 100th anniversary uh, park or something like that. You know, so instead of building a, uh, a building, a commercial building, um, Chula uh, decided to build a, a park, you know, so, uh, and this is uh, on the upper uh, lower right corner here is a picture of Doi Tung, you know, so uh, restoration of uh, nature can provide not only ecological integrity, but also um, generating incomes to the local communities. You know. So NBS is more advantages over the conventional engineering approach in many aspects. For example, it's highly adaptive. Many people talking about re resilience, you know, being resilient, ability to cope with the change, you know, and nature has that capacity. So if we work with the nature, understand the, the nature, we can be highly adaptive. Diversify livelihoods, of course, you know, nature provide many ecosystem services, uh, more cost effective because less investment, uh, small disseminated and integrated system because we not, we looking at the, uh, the system as a whole, inclusive resilience and maintain ecosystem integrities. I already say that, yep. Yeah, uh, come to the Mekong River, uh, you know, this is very contested uh, spaces. 
because Mekong can be a source of energy to generate uh, electricity from dam building. It can be a source of uh, livelihoods. Like you can see like people are relying on, on resources, particularly fishery. Yeah, you mentioned about uh, Tole Saab, you know, like in Cambodian, like 50% of protein intake are coming from fish from Tole Saab. You know, if we don't have the 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 tole sap are not functioning anymore where the protein will come from it's also a source of a, a, a very endangered species like the irawadi dolphin for example is also a, 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 a providing a cultural service this is about this time of the year no we have loy lure fire like no, this is bang fai payana or whatever, right? So it's it's create a lot of income and, and many people joking with me like if we dam the river, will the payana will producing the fireball as it used to be or not? You know, it's also uh, not only the the water that is important, the sediment is also very important because we live in a floodplain and hydropower trap of the sediment, which necessary for agriculture like rice production is also a, a place for transportation on the up, uppermost. So my question is how can we minimize the trace off? You know, like we can build them, we can have electricity, but we lost or everything, you know, but can we maximize and co-benefits uh, of the, the ecosystem service from the river? So that's my big question. And I believe that the answer is yes. This is a global trend in America. They are removing the dams. Why? Because salmon are no longer be able to migrate and lay the eggs. And, 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 and the uh, native American people are uh, saying that this is uh, jeopardize their way of living, you know, and without salmon, they lose identity, they lose you know, language, they lose, you know, they, the, the, the American people put them in the rest of conservation uh, area and then, you know, trying to convert them and then uh, problem come after that, like alcoholics or whatever, you know. And um, this is a, this is very interesting uh, article by one of the uh, um, professor in, in, in humanity. Uh, I think he used to be a, a advisor to the World Bank to build the Nam Ngum dams, which is like 30 years ago, you know, he is approaching 80 years old at the moment. And he write an article that that is a big mistake in his life that, you know, he shouldn't have done uh, or promoting uh, the large dam, you know, it's not worth the cost, you know, and this is a problem in the Colorado River as well. You can see that the climate change, uh, change the whole uh, pattern of precipitation and you know so some places are flat some places are, are, are dry so um, using the conventional approach is very challenging yeah trend in the Mekong um, this is I extracted from the Mekong uh, development strategy the latest report you can see that it's a rapid uh, development you know it's high poverty Hydrology is changing, there's more pressure on the environment. Uh, the delta particularly um, uh, uh, severely affected by salinity intrusions. Um, the more development, the, the, the gap between the rich and the poor are even bigger it's instead of the smaller, right? Economic growth in some, some area, but poverty in another area. So it's not balanced developments. Um, and this is a picture of Tole Sap uh, using a satellite image. You can see that it's shrinking uh, spatially and temporally. So mean, meaning that the area is uh, shrinking and the time that the water reverses, it, you know, is also shrinking. And this is in our region, not far from here. Menam Ing, you know, in Chiang Kong, you know, which uh, normally there is a riparian forest that the Mekong River floods every year. And now because of the regulated uh, water flow upstream, the water is no longer flooding and it has uh, lots of consequence. And the sense of urgency is also growing. Yeah, so this is a 
summary in graph, you can see all of the arrow uh, going down. Yeah, very few going up, except like economics uh, values, right? So we are trading off economic gain with ecological and so sociological loss. Yep. So many, many, I'm, I'm ecological economist. So uh, many people have, um, have studied and quantified the benefit that nature provides. And many uh, articles and uh, publishable articles already say that, you know, sometimes the intact, if we keep the nature intact, the benefits to the human society are greater than the extraction of the of the resources. For example, the forest area, right? The, if the forest area, in conventional economics um, thinking, we have to cut down the tree and turn into the furniture, so we gain um, economic capital. But at the same time, we lose ecological capitals, right? But if we keep that forest intact, forests also provide a lot of benefits to uh, human society like in terms of carbon sequestration in terms of you know habitats or something like that which is outside of the market economy so um, there are many papers that are talking about the 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 you know economic reason for conserve by nature's value of the world ecosystem service and and natural capital something like that and one of the paper estimated the values the benefits are greater than the global GDP. So, yeah. Um, next is um, in Chiang Kong, we did some study using remote sensing, comparing uh, 1995 and 2015. And we found that in Chiang Kong, you know, after the government promote the uh, spatial economic zone or something like that, you know, most of the wetland has been filled, you know, land has been changed from forest into a maze, into the rice farming or something like that. So uh, from ecological perspectives or ecosystem service provided by the land has been decreased over time. All right. So in the past, um, when um, the, the, the ecosystem is in the healthy conditions, you can see this is a picture of the In River. People are going out and fish, you know, even they are not rich in terms of monetary, but I mean, they are very rich in terms of food security, right? So, and they have uh, lots of uh, many things from the, from the wetland forest, including the egg ants, uh, mushroom, bamboo shoot, many things. Yeah, so... Uh, Way forward uh, for NBS, I believe that uh, we have to learn how to live with the floods, you know, so we have to restore the hydrological regimes. The flood plows is the main um, productivities, you know, the main, main reason to make this region as so productive. You know, Mekong River is the second most biodiverse uh, area in the world, second to Amazon, you know, so, and also we have to, co-produce knowledge, ecological knowledge with the local communities. I think they are our ajahn, they are teacher. They know well, they are know much better than the ecologist. You know, they know where and how and when, you know, so we have to include them into the decision-making process. Um, more study on wetland and ecosystem service valuations because this, uh, this study has been undervalued and consider alternative energies. I think nowadays we can have um, electricity security at the same time minimize the loss of uh, ecosystem, especially fish. Like nowadays the, the cost of solar cell are declining, cost per unit of uh, electricity generated are uh, much more comparative, uh, comparable to the dam, the big dam. And you can see that we can help Lao as well by you know, promoting uh, uh, floating solar and integrated this uh, system into the existing reservoir already. For example, like Nam Ngun, we can put floating solar and Lao can uh, help increase their uh, capacity, uh, electricity capacity and then have more income. Why not have to build a new dams? 
uh, this is another picture that they integrated solar cell onto the irrigation uh, canals. This is uh, helping uh, um, evaporations. Yep. Uh, last slides. Uh, I want to end my last slides with one of the quote by Sandra Post Postrel. She is a Stockholm Water Prize, uh, similar to Nobel Prize, uh, 2021 in water. She said nicely, our impressive engineering dam to store water diversion to move it around, powerful pump to tap groundwater, tall levee to control flood has allowed us to control water to expand humanity civilization. But this approach has broken the natural water cycle and we now experiencing the consequence. Our challenge now is to replenish and repair the water cycle to work with nature rather than against it, even as we remain a prosperous society. Yeah, so I compare this to picture, you know, this is a Mekong that used to be before the dams area, the dam era, and now we have more dams. This is the picture down here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Kapachan Apisom, for your presentation. Well, we still have a uh, one room for for question or discussion point for Ajahn Doctor Apisom. If you have any, please. Yes, Kunreni. Ajahn, thank you very much. Thank you very much for interesting topic, Ajahn, about the natural based solution, aka ecosystem based service, or even maybe eco DRR ecological for disaster risk reduction, Ajahn. Um, Ajahn, uh, actually, uh, now our center, there is also try to mainstream. It, but we make the concept with eco DRR, ecological for disaster risk reduction. Uh, the case study can be for flood or even drought, or even uh, we a little bit learn from Indonesia, but the case study is from mangrove because mangrove, kata mangrove, because they are um, how can I say try to reduce little bit tsunami, yeah. So and then we have actually um, Mekong River. Achan, I want to ask. Really, I want to learn how mainstream Achan natural based solution in. Mekong region, how mainstream, and then the second one, Achan, uh, I would like to learn from you as well. What is the success story, Achan, about the natural based solution in Mekong region? Thank you, Achan. Well, uh, first, first of all, this is not the mainstream yet. This is alternative approach. Uh, so, this is a new approach, right? Trying to live with the natures. And uh, in terms of uh, successful case studies, I am I know that the Ministry of Interior now are trying to promote the concept of nature-based solutions. They call Kok Nong Na, but you know, depends on how they do it and what they do it. You know, um, the the success is uh, scattered. You know, depends on each case. Some cases are kind of uh, just for show sure, some cases seriously doing you know like yeah so yeah and and we are working with the uh, ecosystem uh, based adaptations in in river basin i would be very interested and in, uh, to exchange some information with you yes uh, thank you apisam for this very interesting presentation um okay we are talking about social innovation to what extent this uh, nature-based solution is social innovation? It's innovation for sure, but to what extent is it social? <laughs> and uh, I was wondering, I'm an economist at the beginning, long time ago. So in economics, we are talking about the value and how do you evaluate resources um, in terms of utility and non-utility for natural resources, okay? But we stay in the idea of evaluation, economic evaluation is possible. So we think that we can evaluate water from an economic perspective. And uh, when you say that the, uh, there is a decrease in terms of dollars, meaning that you can evaluate in terms of dollars, 
the value of water. So what is your opinion about that? Do you think it's a, because nature-based solution, uh, payment for ecosystemic services and all this, it's a very um, specific way yeah. to think that you can, as a human being, evaluate from an economic perspective, the value of nature. So how do you integrate the idea of knowledge co-production? How do you evaluate what is non-human perspective? What, all this in this kind of uh, approach. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> like many presenters in the morning, no? we, I'm not sure what social innovation means. Many people coming here with that uh, kind of <laughs> understanding. But I think it's innovative in a way. No? But is it social innovation or not? Um, if, 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 if the human society learn, you know, learn the, the mistake from the past, the mistake of like scientific, you know, um, only, you know, um, um, that would be a social innovation, but I, I don't know whether, um, how far uh, this concept will be going, but, mm -hmm. but I have seen a lot of uh, movement no, no, not in Thailand, but in other countries, like, uh, for example, uh, re-indigenizing, you know, like thinking like, like indigenous people, like in Australia or in, 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 in uh, America, you know, uh, or even like uh, the, 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 the work with Taiban research that trying to uh, shed light on the wisdom of local communities, like, like Pakayo or something like that. I, I myself also uh, work with uh, Ban Pohit Latnai, you know, I'm, I'm learning from them a lot, uh, philosophically and then uh, practically. Uh, in terms of valuations, uh, of course, um, we are estimated in monetary values. But valuation is not pricing. It is uh, comparable with other goods and products, and we have ways to do it. In in like for example, uh, um, let's say uh, when uh, I work with the hydropower development evaluation, economic evaluation, I found that you know some of the commodities or some of the attributes are not fully accounted. For example, the loss of sediments, they are not counted in their CBA, in their cost benefit analysis, you know, but the loss of sediment, how much, if, if the economist has to put the dollar values in, we have to find like, okay, if we lost the sediment, the downstream people has to supplement that loss with the fertilizer. Okay, let's say we lost 30 tons of the sediment, that means we lost 30 ton of fertilizer or something like that. And we know the price of the fertilizer, right? Something like that. And your questions is about uh, something like aesthetic or biodiversity. That is even difficult to value, right? But it doesn't mean that it doesn't have values, but we just don't know, right? But yeah, yeah it's not economic values, but we are trying to say that that is a values, but I don't know what value it is, but, but apply zero is absolutely wrong you know but it but number i don't know maybe 10 or 100 or because values depend on people um priority right if we we think this is very important to us we keep a very high values too right so and and the value is changing over over times right yeah so so uh, my my exercise is to to show that this is having the values and trying to invite people to discuss, you know, by ignoring, it's mean that you apply zero values to them, which I think is not uh, correct, you know. Uh, and I found like many other things that are not properly values as well. For example, in the CBA of the MRC uh, studies, they're not values the, the uh, uh, ecological loss, uh, suppose like, uh, when the, the water uh, fluctuated uh, daily, it caused land erosions, for example. So land erosions, how can we value that? Okay, the value one way is to do it is to, to see how much the government invests in stabilizing that uh, riverbank, for example. That is a cause of 
of irregulation of, of water flows. So, so there is a proxy. There is a proxy values. Did I answer your question? It's, it's not exact, but... That's, uh, but I, yeah. I don't have the same uh, <laughs> vision because it's very... It's because it's a, it's a theoretical question also. Oh. Meaning that uh, can you evaluate if you, if you lose the, um, the beauty of the landscape, how do you evaluate that? You see? Yeah. I was talking with people of Tamui village, you know? And uh, it's a complicated question. And it's very anthropocentric. Yeah. That's a problem for me. Right, right. Yeah, uh, what, what I'm presented here is more biocentric point of view, right? A nature-based solution is mean putting nature in the center and less focus on human. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, have, um, sorry for interrupting. Um, well, we have spent time for uh, the first two presentation and uh, so we need to compensate for Ajahn Mali. <laughs> Sorry for that. Um, but you still have uh, 30 minutes. So uh, the presentation of Ajahn Mali will be on EIA Van Lab, uh, the politics of EIA in water management of Thai state uh, presented by uh, Professor Dr. Mali Siti Kwenkai from RCSD Chiang Mai University. I will turn uh, the microphone to Ajahn, please. Yes. Thank you, Ajahn. And good afternoon, everyone. For my present, it, the topic is uh, EIA Ran Rap. I think that for the front friends, maybe you, I think you may not know the meaning of EIA Ran Rap. But for Thai people, may they know, no? Ajahn Apisom, you know, EIA Ran Rap, no? So, and I will explain later. What is the uh, EIA Ran Lab? Yes. Yeah. Yes. EIA, you know, EIA, Environment Impact Assessment yes. Yes. and Ran Lab. It like a meeting room for uh, people participation. Mm. Ran Lab. Mm. It's not the meeting room as this one, but Thai government use a Ran Lab as the meeting room for people participation mm -hmm. for EIA. And how can I use this one? Okay. Oh. <laughs> okay. And for this presentation, I will argue that the social in innovation, I think that Ajahn Apisom also uh, explain and Ajahn Chiyan try to explain. And for my idea, I think that social innovation is a, it like a benefit for achievement sustainable development. And I, EIA is a one example of social in innovation because EIA is tied to minimize the environmental impact of development activities. And I also argue that EIA has become a state tool and give the example, the EIA run lab. And I also attempt to uh, examine the co-production of knowledge as a social innovation that try to empower local communities to produce a fair EIA because the EIA is produced by the state is unfair. And how we make the fair EIA that respect the natural resources and culture. And I will uh, start by the, what is the water management of Thai state? I think that there are three items. The first one, Thai state, or uh, I think maybe the in the eye of the developers, always see that, never see water as a river but seen liver as water. And water is an energy or resource for development. And also water management is in the hand of experts and technocrats. And I will, Elia, the our 
King p u m i p o l gave this speech on the 1986. He is very give important to the water. He said that the important principle is that there must be water, water for consumption, water for use, and water for agriculture, because life is there. If there is water, human can exist. If there is no water, human can can't exist. There is no electricity, so human can survive. But if there is electricity, but no water, human cannot survive. And again, he said that progress, Thai, uh, Thai society will progress, will be impossible without water. So he very give uh, important to the waters, and we can observe that every mega project to build up them in Thailand, the irrigation department always uh, use apply his idea to for this uh, for the mega project, and so water management is innovation by the technology. I think that from my friend uh, in the Chinese case, also uh, mentioned about build up many dams on upper Mekong rivers, and the big pictures. Can you guess where is it? Where is it? Mekong rivers, Mekong rivers, Mekong river is doubt. It is a uh, two thousand nineteen. After Sayaburi Dam is running, it is it like a, a tile to run run this uh, Sayaburi in the uh, July 2019. And this occur in uh, October or December 2019. And what is it? This is a uh, hungry rivers. On so Mekong rivers, from mighty river to hungry rivers, in nine two thousand nineteen as well, this area in Amper Sangkom, Nong Kai Sangkom District, um, Nong Kai Province, northeast of Thailand, it uh, this river is border Thai and Lao, yeah. and this also I never seen. Mekong River like this, no waters, because uh, we use the technologies. And EIA, EIA is tied to Elia to make a minimize impact to the development. And I think that EIA in the Eli on the paper na. It as a social innovation because it tied to release the impact of the to the environment, but in reality, in Thailand, I would like to tell you that in Thailand, impact EIA is began in nineteen seventy five and uh, strongly in nineteen ninety two. And this I say from the book. A political economy of in environmental impact assessment in the Mekong region. This book is very good to uh, explore about the EIA. This uh, some parts I I uh, get from this uh, book, impact environment environmental impact assessment assessment frequently has become a bureaucratic and technical exercise. Emphasizing the writing and approval of scientific document rather than part of the holistic planning process. And the second one, this book kitting of the Thai process include weak social safeguard and the reality that participation procedure are not uniformly applied. Interview we state that some public hearing were just the process of gathering people to get the rather than meaningful participations. And the other one, 
the quality of those uh, documents is often very poor, even after they have been approved for the EIA in the Sarawin, your water diversion, approved at least three times. But it making in inevitable that environmental impact will not be adequately addressed by project developers. And I will uh, continue to uh, your Salawin water diversion project. This project it passed EIA, but it not implemented in Thai society. Uh, you can see this project. No? Don't make up. Don't need a This project, this area composed of three area. The first one is the to construct a Yuam Dam. Yuam Dam. Yuam Dam is on the Yuam Rivers. And after Yuam River, it flow to Mai Rivers. And Mai River flow to Salawin River. Salawin River is the like international river as the Mekong Rivers. And it's the border river between Thai and Myanmar. And this is the first part of this project. After build up the dam, the dam, the water it, it will transfer to this area. And this area, there are the six pumping station. And the water it will divert, transfer through the uh, tunnel, the tunnel to the end of the tunnel at Ban Mengut, at uh, Hot. Chiang Mai province, this area in Mae Hong Son province, and this area in Chiang Mai province. And after that, the water will transfer to Pumipon Dam. And Pumipon Dam is uh, built up in 1964, it more than 50 years ago. And the, this project will transfer water to the Pumipon Dam. And even you see the red dye, red line, but the red dye is not the flat land, it's the mountain area. Most in this area, they are Korean ethnic groups. They are Korean ethnic groups. And we, uh, I study, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, I explained already. And the history of the Yuam Water Diversion Project. This project is not the first initiate. It, uh, the Thai government want to build up the dam in uh, Ma La Ma Luang Dam. Ma La Ma Luang Dam is near the Ma La Ma Luang uh, refugee camp. And at that time, the local people big protest and Thai government cannot uh, continue this project. And 2005, this project come again. And after that, it stopped until 2016, start for the uh, EIA. And 2021, EIA uh, approved by the uh, National Environment Board, approved it already. And for our uh, active, and I will tell you about the EIA, what is it? And for this uh, Yuam Sarawin, uh, the water diversion project, it divert water across the main river basin. And the investment, I cannot read this number now. Kathleen, can you help me? <laughs> <laughs> I cannot read this. Okay. But interesting. Each year we have to pay for the electric cost, water pumping cost, allow 82 million, 82 billion, no? 82 yeah. billion, yes. And this we have to pay each year. And for this project, it cover five national forest reserve and one preparing to decay as national park. Yeah. And 
Now I will explain EIA Run Lab. You can see that is the run, uh, local uh, run, run. I think that she knows uh, because you live in Thailand for a long time. Maybe you help me explain <laughs> to <laughs> run lab. I think that you have Thai. Do you have Thai? It run lab. No, and you ได้เคยไปกินไหมร้านลาบเคยกินลาบไหมเออโอเคค่ะ so ร้าน it means that local restaurant นะ at a m a s a l i a n district local restaurant ร้าน in Thai word it means local restaurant ลาบ it means a local northern Thai food ร้านลาบอิดเลยโลเคอลเรสเตอร์ลองฮูบายฮูเซลเดอร์โลเคอลนอร์เทนไทฟูดแอนอินดิสอีเวนต์อินเอ่อไอติงแดดฟิฟทีนเซตเทมเบอร์เอ่อทูทาวเซนเอทีนออสวิชเยอไอแคนอาริเมมเบอร์แอนเดอะเอ่ออัสตาฟออฟเดอะเอไอเอนะเอไอเอออฟฟิเชียลออสัมวันแอนดิสเอไอเอเอ่อสเตทเอไอเออิดเมดบายเดอะเอ่อโปรเฟสเซอร์ฟอร์มนาเลสวนยูนิเวอร์ซิตี้เนี่ยแอนเดอะสตาฟฮูคอร์เรกเอไอเอเอ่ออาร์เดอะเวลเจอร์สทูมีดอินเดอะร้านลาบบัตอัฟเซเดตดิสฟิเจอร์ Was reported in the EIA and tell that this is a part of the people participations. So that's a so that um uh among us in Thai in Thai society we call EIA run lab. It like a irony, no, for Thai people. EIA ร้านลาบ yes and uh, EIA ร้านลาบ I think that for this it unethical no and not uh, no people participations and this uh, the one who in who uh, in who uh, in who uh, invited to the ร้านลาบ she said he said that His name is Satana. He said that participation is just a ritual of attendance. We hardly have a chance to voice out, or if we manage to do so, they just don't listen to us. Yeah, he said like this, and I think that for this uh, EIA l a n r a p it implies that the EIA or the Thai state. Did not do not recognize the people who live around that area, yeah. And this picture also uh, put in the EIA state EIA, nah. But after that, we uh, asked the villagers, and the villagers said that the irrigation department sent this man to give a gift. For the villagers, and only expand the projects positively. And for example, to for if the project is implement, a uh, villager here they will get a employment and they can get a electricity and good load or something like that. And for more more than that, they show this picture as a people participations. And for the EIA is on inaccurate data. I can I not tell you that about this map. This map you can see the Thai angle, many Thai angle. We count at least forty five communities allow the construction area, but in IA mention that. Only twenty uh, nine persons in affected by this project. Yeah, oh. and for this area, you know that uh, the ethnic people who live on the mountain, 
Thai government never give them the land title. So it means that if this project implemented in this area, no compensation at all. Or if they get and they get a few. Yeah. And in the EIA mention they live in the forest, they lie a savage and also reduction apples. They don't think as the ethnic people, the connect, the relationship between the natures and the ethnic groups. They see that liver as a water, fish not related to the water, and tea is not in the forest. Tea is the tea. And also this area is a, a, a earthquake front line. So for this event, how we can do? I think that the first time when we uh, met the villagers, at that time, only, only one way that we protest to say that we disagree this EIA. And I asked them, what about your reason? If the government argue why you disagree, to the EIA, how do you explain to them? Yes. And after that, we, I and Ajahn Chayan go to the community many times, and we think that we are academia. We can use our brain knowledge for movement. We call co-production of knowledge with the affected communities. And we cannot uh, do research in the 45 communities. We choose only two communities, the mouth of the tunnel and the end of the tunnel, two communities. And build up the local research term, the research team, and use the participatory action research, cultural mapping, and I also send my uh, research uh, assistant. They are the Korean people, to live with them as a, and use the participant observation. And what the data we collect, this is a, a example, community history and development, livelihood, local ecological system and knowledge. And we also uh, collect data by survey and to ask them opinions toward the projects. Yeah. And this, the, uh, the cultural mapping for after we work with the villagers, the villagers they are drawing the map about their community area, and we can see that there are many uh kind of uh, environment about the conservation stream and the conservation forest and rivers and many yeah. And this also, uh, when you see, uh, when the irrigation department come to the uh, village and see the Yom River, they see the Yom River as the left-hand side, but when the villagers see the, the Yom River, it's the right-hand side. The meaning is totally different. And this also, the villagers try to explain to us that, how do they live on the, with the forest? And what the product they call, the forest product, they collect from the forest. And how their life rely on those forest product. You see that the mountain, the single mountain, but in reality, it's not only single, no? it's many. And this, uh, the model, the villagers try to explain to us. And the villagers uh, divide the mountain to uh, three layers. And the uh, bottom up, they said that many kinds of vegetable, if the, uh, this uh, project is implemented, the bottom up, it will be flat and their food is gone. So this uh, kind of the village, uh, the cultural mapping, and you can see that the the left hand side, this uh, area of the uh, the end of the tunnel, this uh, cultural mapping is the Ban Mengut. 
but may go the end of the tunnel. And mostly they are the Korean. And they grow the long gang which uh, Ajahn uh, Chayan uh, mentioned, but different area. No? And for this urban mangoes, they are suffer many times. First, 1960 uh, flows, the first migration by the uh, Pumipon Dam was constructed. And after that, uh, migrate again. And they also uh, mentioned that for this time, we, we insist that we not migrate anymore. We will die here. Yeah. And we also Elia survey and try to Elia, Elia convert the cultural value to the economic value in Ban Mengun and Ban Mengau. Yeah. And for to terminate state EIA for us academia, we work in the left hand side and we also work with the CSO communities. And each partner, there is their own uh, obligations. And we work together and we exchange and we communicate together. Until the last two weeks, we submit our draft research. And the lawyers and the uh, lecturer in uh, en water engineer and many submit our uh, idea and our uh, opinion and we and we submit our research to the administrative court because the villagers uh want uh uh Elia propose uh, sub propose propose uh, to the administrative court we want to stop uh this project and to terminate state EIA. This we are doing. And I think that we use the knowledge for movement and to help the villagers for community lives. Knowledge should be exchanged with the people, not changed among us. It not only published in the journal, but it should to support the community to resist hegemonic, hegemonic knowledge. I think that this is social innovation for my idea. Thank you. Thank you, Kapitan Nalu. Uh, then is there any question or discussion point? It's a chance to uh, talk to the speaker. Thank you for your speech and I'm very moved by it. And uh, I, I, it, it's, a saying I I just told to uh, told told Simon about it is like, uh, the advantage for a country, uh, no, it's a country's advantage of low human rights, some kind of, in this uh EIA line up so that the government can can fool people by the the like the pictures in Lan Lab, just like uh, some, some, something familiar in China. So uh, as, I, I don't know if French can, can imagine that. Like, for example, the, the, uh, let's talk about the LMC. China helps Laos to build a railway, right? If one day the French government said, let's help Spain, to build a railway and spend no need to pay about it, uh, no need to pay anything instead of turn into a national debt. And voila, we built it. After that, some someday Macron is very delightful. And he said, okay, let's just cancel the debt. Let's just cancel the debt. Uh, we, we just give the railway to spend. How would you do? How would French do? How would French people do? I don't know if you can imagine that, but, but in China, it's real. China built the railway for Laos and uh, turned it into the national debt of Laos. And then one day, 
uh, not yet, but China has already uh, canceled the national debt for the African countries. But maybe one day, Chinese government may, may say, okay, let's cancel the debt by Laos, uh, from Laos. So nobody can say anything about it because it's an advantage of low human rights by the nation. Yeah, that's what I'm going to talk about it. Mali, um, okay, do you think that uh, all the work you've been doing for the last years, long, long time, does can you see an impact on the EIA process? Do you see, I mean, how could you impact the way things are being done and how this could be integrated? Not maybe instead of, because it would be too <laughs> difficult, but how this could change the way that this evaluation process are conducted on the, on the field? by the state. So that EIA is finished now, and now we do uh, Elia people. I'm EIA. sure, but there will yeah. be others. I mean, it's a yes. way the, the oh, in all countries, it's a way it, it works. So for the next one, do you think that what you've done here will have an impact on future EIA in other projects? Oh, for this, I am, I, I am, I am not sure. Not yeah, not sure yet. Because we, 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 and the impact, I think that impact to the local communities who work with us. Yeah. They, Elia, they, it, no, they, Elia, they know and they can analyze the impact of the this project and they more confidence and they have more systematic uh, knowledge to explain uh, their uh, communities yeah and they can elect if they know more and when government officials come to the village i think that in China, government officials and local communities, the power it 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 like it a gap, no. It, so I think that now after the villagers, they know a lot and they learn. It like we learn, they learn from us and from the many uh, organization. And I think now when the government come and they can negotiate to the government, yeah. And for the to uh, point our way to the uh, state, if they uh, will uh, do the EIA for the mega project and what they have to aware or something like that, we don't do like this. Okay. Um, well, we, we still have time for a discussion after the session number six. But uh, well, we, we may start uh, uh, the last session uh, from Dr. Gabriel Faisal from uh, EHASEC uh, on negotiating the social aid for an indigenous society newly converted to Islam. So uh, we have 40 minutes for uh, Dr. Faisal. So, uh, I don't want to waste anybody's time, so I will pass the microphone to Dr. Faisal, please. Yes, thank you so much. So um, I am an anthropologist by training, and uh, I have been in the Kanekes uh, area only a dozen of times for a very short period. Um, but uh, still, um, I went there for the last time uh, this year, and I collected the data that I will present you today. Uh, first time I went there, it was in around 2003. It was uh, just to do short research about martial arts. Uh, I went there also to do some interviews regarding cosmologies, rituals, agrarian practices, social social organization. 
And recently, I uh, connected with a good friend of mine in uh, in this uh, region of Banten in, uh, in uh, West Java in Indonesia. And uh, we went to Kanekes because since uh, a dozen of years, he's developing a program of uh, social aid, particularly uh, in the health field. So he's uh, providing uh, health care with uh, doctors and nurses there. He opened two small clinics, very small structures with only one staff and uh, non-permanent staff. And um, so I was interested in this uh, health program because I realized that there were very um, important problems of health in the in the Kanekes community, whereas in the national imaginary, this community is considered as a very resilient, uh, with a very uh, healthy uh, lifestyle, which is the case, but they have been uh, pressured by demographic uh, uh, in, uh, growth and uh, all the kind of, uh, of uh, social, political, environmental pressures. And the health is uh, very declining with uh, very high rates of tuberculosis, uh, also uh, important domestic uh, accidents like uh, snake bites and no access at all to uh, healthcare. Uh, unless they're traditional practices, but uh, uh, the, many people are in a survival only because of health threats. Uh, today, I will talk about uh, some Kanekes who have moved from this village, from this area actually, to uh, the surrounding uh, areas because they wanted to access to more comfort, to uh, health care particularly, and to education for their uh, children. So for them, it's a kind of social innovation. For the promoters of those villages who are um, Muslim uh, foundations, it's also an innovation. And for many Kanekes and external observers, it's a social regression or a more or less social initiative uh, only. So it's a very polysemic uh, development in the Kanekes area. So let me present you the, the Kanekes region. It's here in, uh, yeah, in Banten. Banten is a province that has been created in 2000 after the decentralization process in Indonesia. You can see it in, a, in the red circle. It's uh, only 170 kilometers from Jakarta, but you have to pass through the north and then uh, to, the, to the west and then to the, to the south. So it's uh, five to seven uh, hours of drive. Um, the community in the Kanekes is inhabiting uh, a land of forests in the mountain range called uh, Kendeng, which is separated uh, West Java and Banten. The community is only 16,000 uh, um, people. They live in 5,000 uh, hectares. Uh, and it counts three hamlets called uh, inner hamlets, which are, are the center of the territory, and 65 uh, surrounding hamlets called outer hamlets. Those different hamlets have uh, different um, rules regarding the use of technology. They have also different uh, rituals, agrarian practices, but they share the same philosophy regarding um, technology at large, which is Mountains shall not be destroyed, valleys should not be broken, long shall not be cut, and short shall not be joined. So these are very broad principles and they have very concrete and very large implication regarding the use of uh, technology and lifestyles. Since the establishment of the Indonesian Republic in 1945 and after reformacy, the decentralization process in 1998, these Kanekes have met increasing pressures, but also they have encountered different opportunities for access to modern technologies. The, um, the novel technologies are brought by different actors. First, we find the state, which offers limited planning and development programs. On the surrounding of the territory, we also find private companies aiming at industrial exploitation of forest resources, particularly in the pine oil sector and they can have impact on water, on soil, on air pollutions. Prior to electoral campaigns, we can find uh, parties pushing for, for the administrative registration of the Kanekes in order they be able to vote. And at the same time, they are lobbying them. And even some former Kanekes have uh, announced their candidacy for the next legislative elections. It's a new uh, phenomenon. 
those elections are planned for February 2024. So there is something very novel now occurring in the Kanekes area in terms of political participation. Finally, we find three charity Muslim foundations which provide health services and facilitate the conversion to Islam of the outer Kanekes. The activity of those different actors, the states, the companies, uh, the Muslim foundations and so on, intersect with rapid material changes, environmental and demographic pressures, and they lead to a plurality of uh, structural challenges. The first one comes with public policy at the national level. It has an impact on two areas. The first one uh, regards indigenous status, and the second one regards agricultural policy. So regarding indigenous status, in Indonesia, we count around 300 ethnic groups for approximately 1,340 communities. And um, different bills have been passed in the last years, which regard the rights of those indigenous communities. In 2012, constitu constitutional court ruled that indigenous people's customary forests were not to be managed by the state anymore, but by the communities themselves. But efforts to pass the law, a law on their rights have ramped up. And until 2018, there had been 16 ministerial regulations regarding indigenous uh, peoples, but uh, no uh, specific law to catch up those different bills. And beginning in 2012, the main advocacy group for these indigenous communities, which is called AMAN, has worked on a bill designed to simplify this quite chaotic mix of rules. The law they have designed was supported by President Joko Widodo uh, since 2014, but it was never voted by the parliament. And by Amman's count, uh, until now, there are at least 50 million indigenous Indonesian which are still awaiting their constitutional rights, particularly regarding the possession and the use of land. A second range of uh, impacts from uh, national legislative development regards the agrarian policy. While in 2010, the urban population represented 50% of the total population, in 2045, it's expected to reach um, 70%. And the aims of the government's agricultural policy are to meet international standards, to integrate agriculture more deeply into the global market, and to modernize equipment. So these objectives are likely to be the same regardless of whoever will be elected as a president for the next elections in February 2024, because I have mentioned it this morning, Prabhu Subianto was the head of HKTI, which is a very mainstream and pro-neoliberal uh, uh, agriculture organization in Indonesia. While the government recently announced the conversion and allocation of 20, um, 12 million hectares, the University of Bogor, the IPB, which is specialized on agrarian research and studies, points out that a lot of land is subject to speculation rather than actual use. All these agrarian reforms dynamics could threaten the preservation of the environmental resources surrounding the Kanekes territory in a region which is already heavily exploited by the palm oil production companies that I have mentioned earlier. And at the provincial level, agricultural policy is no different from that of Jakarta. Moreover, administrative services in Banten suffer for, from very poor management. The region has one of the highest rates of corruption in the archipelago. In 2010, the administrative buildings were grouped together in the same area as part of a property development project, which was marked by serious irregularities and with proven cases of cooptation of department sectors. Generally speaking, these um, departments at the provincial level uh, have very uh, poor ambitious programs and they are uh, badly monitored. They show a bureaucratic distance from the development management on the ground. Finally, at the district level now, there is, a more, there is more interaction, for example, in the form of mediation between local authorities and neighboring populations in connection with water pollution or illegal logging, for instance. But here again, governance mechanisms are opaque, and both the formulation and monitoring of development programs depend on clientelistic network. The majority of my work was focused on there uh, since my master until my, uh, the end of my PhD thesis. 
Internally, Kaneke society is also faced with a number of development di dilemmas. First of all, tourism. Tourism was formally implemented in 1994 by the tourism Depart department, and it was supported by the social political department at the provincial level. And it expanded in the early 2000s, reaching a peak before COVID in 2019 with around 42,000 visitors a year. This growth has generated nuances, particularly in terms of waste pollution. And uh, this phenomenon led the Council of Elders of the Kanekes to ask the provincial government to put a stop to so-called cultural tourism, uh, Wisata Budaya. Nevertheless, tourism continues today to a lesser extent, and the government maintains its promotion in the brochure, in the, in the booklets uh, of, the, of the national and the provincial government. This continuation is also linked to divergent internal uh, visions regarding tourism, with some members of the community wishing to continue their activity, for instance, as guides or as retailers. And it is particularly the case for the villages on the edge of the territory of the Kanekes, which have opened small kiosks in a parking area. Here you can see a map. I really need the participatory uh, mapping, as was presented by Kun uh, Mali. The same dilemma uh, for uh, tourism arises more generally regarding access to comfort technology, such as transport, fuel lighting, and telecommunications, because it is prohibited to have those technologies in the Kanekes area. But many Kanekes overpass the rules by going in the surroundings of the area to use this technology in a quite a secret way. Um, in such a way that the elder committee has struggled um, to prohibit Wi-Fi coverage of the area. Circumvention convention of community rules are also common, common to issues like education of Kanekes kids in the national school uh, system or in access to health care provided by the government or private players like the uh, Muslim Foundation. In this way, the Muslim organization in charge of health care also informally disseminates religious knowledge and good practices, um, for instance, in the field of agrarian practices, which have led a small part of the population to settle in a Muslim village close to the territory. Nevertheless, the Muslim organization reports the difficulties in governing these villages because the converted Kanekes continue to practice a nomadic way of subsistence in the forest surrounding the village, and they make little use of the, garden, the, the gardens which are provided by the Muslim foundation. There are also external critics, which report that the village is in fact in majority populated by ex Kanekes who converted to Islam in the early uh, 80s, so almost 40 years ago. And um, this, this village are also populated, according to those critics, to um, by surrounding Muslim population who found a shelter in this village. This last situation, which requires further ethnological investigation, and it will be my next, my next field work there, shows that Kanekes enact resistance, in fact, in different ways. The first one is the James Scott uh, style uh, daily resistance because the Kanekes do not mobilize or make demons. They have no uh, social movement, in fact. They only maintain their way of life, they practice their ritual, and they pass on their stories. So let me do a, a small digression about these stories, because it's, for me, it's a resistant strategy to maintain these foundation tales. According to, the, to these tales, the Kanekes are an elder society in Banten, in charge of the protection of the surrounding communities inhabiting the downstream plains, of the Chiujung River, the source of the river is in the Kanekes. At the opposite, the urban Muslims, particularly in Serang, the administrative uh, center of Banten, and the provincial government mobilized the work of historians supporting that the Kanekes paid allegiance to the political authorities of the north, the Muslim authorities, in fact, since the Islamizing of the region in the 16th century. So this discursive distinction in relation to governmental and official historical discourse, for me, can be analyzed as stubbornness in a posit positive sense, as it has been given by Tania Lee and Birgit Müller in an impactful paper. For them, stubbornness is a highly political activity for politics starts with when actors stubbornly give their own sense to the world and they act in terms of that sense. 
Another point of contention regards intermediation. To carry out the interactions with the authorities, the community has formed a diplomatic com committee, the, com the community of the Kanekes, I mean, they have formed a diplomatic committee under the tutelary of a council of elders. Nevertheless, the provincial government has also appointed a more formal intermediary member, so there is a kind of competition, and this intermediary member for years was in charge of collecting the registration of tourists coming to the area. This intermediary has also given rise to a great deal of tension because of problems with the redistribution of the tourism windfall and partly because of its lobbying role for the government party at the period, the Galkar. In this context of cross-sectoral interaction between the Kanekes, the government, private actors, and uh, Muslim NGOs, Kanekes rely on their reticular organization to cope with pressures and to size opportunities. The buffer role played by the outer villages of the Kanekes, which is extended to a second level with the surrounding villages of the Kanekes, has been in full play since the reformacy, so since the early 2000s, actually. It has enabled the formal maintenance of the social structure, that's to say the complex of statuses, of functions within and between the inner and outer villages. At the same time, it has maintained enough flexibility to allow members of the community to benefit from the tools and the technology of the outside world, but only on an ad hoc and informal or even secret basis. And over the various rules over, overpassed by the Kanekes, those relating to health are probably the most complex because in extreme emergencies, those health issues have given rise to extraordinary, extraordinary derogations, which increase the legitimacy of the Islamic organization that takes on the medical mission and indirectly facilitates the conversion process. The situation is made possible by the failure of the state, of course, to provide an adequate medical service which implicitly delegates the responsibility of the medical uh, health care to civil society actors like the aforementioned uh, Muslim Foundation. Therefore, in the post joko Widodo Indonesia, an important part of the conditions for the survival of the Kanekes as an indigenous society will depend on both legislative progress on uh, the health care providing and substantial democracy through public consultation and implementation. We have already talked about participatory uh, schemes uh, from the bottom in order to address uh, and to fit to the localized, contextualized uh, issues. So to finish, should we consider this Muslim village as a social innovation or as a pos potential social regression? The village is very new. It has been only established in the, in the last five years, just before COVID, actually. So we don't have the, the, the background to, to assess uh, the, the viability of this village. If we consider the different viewpoints of the actors involved, we can see that the village is the polysemic initiative. For the promoters of the village, the Muslim Foundation, it's presented as a promise of access to modernity, to individual comfort, for instance, education, healthcare, and lastly, salvation, religious salvation. For the Kanekes who stayed in the Kanekes territory, which is the immense majority of the community, it is just a marketing strategy or even a deception. So it is a fake village composed by uh, already converted uh, people uh, some decades ago and surrounding Muslim population. And finally, for the village, the villagers, the village is a more or less social initiative, though it's not totally a social innovation, which enables a fluid situation based on an informal status, the possibility of mobility beyond the village to access the forest surrounding the village or to go to the city. And therefore, it enables them to access to different types of resources and regimes of norms and uses. So that's all, uh, all for me. Thank you, for, thank you so much. Thank you very much for our presentation. Then it's time for uh, everybody to ask a question or have some discussion with uh, the presenter, please. Okay. <laughs>
<laughs> okay. Uh, well, uh, since uh, the presenter said that uh, this is time for everybody, no? Um, well, uh, I would like to to wrap uh, the thing up uh, a little bit uh, from the first presentation that we have this afternoon from uh, the paper from session four, um, LMC and the securitization. We have seen um, the big picture of the relationship between governments in uh, this area. Um, dealing with the problem of uh, how how can we define security um, on on the management of natural resources on the Mekong River, uh, especially the thing that the government count as um, the asset or resources, including uh, what can be um, the thing that the people from the local area can negotiate with. Uh, both the governments and um, other countries' government. Then uh, after that, we have shifted from um, the big problem in, in the Mekong River to um, the presentation on nature-based solutions for water governance, um, which is presented by Dr. Apisom from the School of Management. Uh, his point is very interesting on uh, how can we how can we uh, be back to a good relationship between human and nature and uh, talking about uh, the protection, the management and restoration uh, of the nature for uh, uh, both humans well-being and uh, protection of biodiversity. And the, the, the thing that he had presented is very uh, important for uh, those who may have the different uh, point of view towards uh, development, especially those who believe in um, biocentric or even ecocentric development um, approaches. Um, one thing that I have got from, from Ajahn Apisom's presentation is um, the holistic approach is still important for uh, solving the problem together, uh, especially when we have the conflict on uh, space contest between uh, authority and uh, the local people, including um, the, the thing that they don't have a chance or any power to bargain or negotiate with uh, the authority, like life below waters. Uh, that's a thing that that uh, I can see from uh, Jan Apisom's presentation. And then uh, we have seen um, the other explanation on uh, authority and um, alternative uh, way to bargain with the, the authority from uh, Ajahn Mali's presentation on EIA Ran Lab, talking about uh, the problem that we can see from um, EIA done by the government or by government's fund, uh, which is um, unethical and sometimes uh, inaccuracy, right? Uh, then we have got EIA as a kind of uh, stamp rubber to, to pass the, the big project which affect um, the whole community even um, the ecosystem. So uh, this is the thing that we can see um, the negotiation and the bargaining between um, the two sides of the society, the authority and the local people. And again, we can see uh, the other example of uh, new uh, negotiation uh, from um, the, the indigenous people from uh, the case of Banten in West Java, right? Uh, on uh, getting the social aid, even though it, they are just uh, converted to be Islam, if I got it right. <laughs> uh, well, it, this, this seems to be very interesting for us to see the power of the people at the local community to uh, have that place in... Uh, policy or the improvement of 
economy and society. So uh, this is the thing that I have got from four presentations. And this is the time for uh, everybody to share their view, uh, to, to, to um, get some idea for tomorrow's discussion. I, I, I will pass uh, this chance to everybody. Uh, where according to the schedule, now we still have time until um, five, five, no? Okay, we have almost uh, 60 minutes, Cup. So the, the floor is yours. Well, just a reaction, but maybe uh, I would need to reflect more. But uh, what comes in mind, if uh, we hear all the presentation is the difference uh, in scale and uh, what uh, it entails in terms of uh, approach, uh, if we think about the initiative of uh, of Dewey, as a, is, it has been also commented by Xavier, uh, all the initiatives that have been presented are uh, localized um, initiatives, which enable a kind of fluidity uh, of uh, organization arrangements and also um, adaptations according to the context, uh, without, of course, occulting the struggles it entails and the inventivity it requires to, to be effective and uh, sustainable, of course. But if we change of scale and uh, we address uh, international agreements uh, in the Mekong region or a participatory approach, uh, instrumentalized at the national level, um, as it has been presented by uh, Ajahn Mali, uh, we see that uh, it's more difficult to, to have this kind of uh, informality and flexibility and uh, comes the problem of how to formalize the terms to have uh, cooperation, uh, multi-sectoral, multi-scale uh, collaboration in order to achieve more sustainable social and environmental uh, schemes. So uh, just my first uh, thought that this difference uh, into scales entails also different approaches from us. We can see that, uh, for instance, here we, uh, with, uh, with Dewey and Xavier, we have um, a more holistic uh, approach on how the things should be sustainable. And uh, for the, the, the friend and colleagues from the Synologist uh, School, uh, it's more difficult for you to envision that because at the international level, how can you put it in place? So uh, that's why maybe also we have different approaches because the difference of scales and uh, yeah, I don't know if you want to react about that. But I think that when we talked about social innovation, we had different visions of what was social first and innovation uh, second. So I just wanted to share my view uh, based on Adan of Hisom's presentation. And um, he showed examples of how uh, there's a process of rewilding, like roads, uh, 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 nature is brought back into the picture and there's more emphasis, there's more value. And um, after reflecting on that, I feel like it was only after America became developed that this awareness of returning back to nature or bringing back nature became became relevant for everybody. And so in a sense, uh, I think um, in the Mekong region, bringing back this idea, while we haven't been able to fully develop and create roads in the first place, would uh, perhaps create some Let's say it would make it more difficult for people in the region to uh, appreciate it as compared to in America where they already experienced the setbacks of overdevelopment in the, the specific areas. Hmm. For me, it's a chance that uh, <laughs> you didn't... Uh... Yeah, it's not a problem of being developed. And when you are developed, you think about environmental issues. Now you have the climate change is here for everyone. So there is no discussion about what to do, waiting for development, but which development? This development created the environmental issues. So I, I didn't understand what you meant, in fact. It's not, it's not because... It's not once the U.S. are developed that they can 
take into account the environmental dimension. They take into account the environmental dimension because they cannot do something else today because they are facing so huge environmental issues. So I think that some developing developing countries uh, are lucky not yes. to I, have... I totally agree with your point of view. I am not anti any form of development. It's just that um, in the what I was trying to explain was just the the um what do you say the issue as it is i mean uh people are being forced to develop, to change the ways that we live in america is a result and um yes we have an opportunity here to let's say make things better before they get worse and i agree with you from that standpoint no 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 In Indonesia, we are also facing the same problem with our rivers, the especially the big one, Bengawan Solo and Serayu. Uh, there is a, a, how do you say it in English, a siloing, uh, because of the 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 soil from the hills coming down because of of this uh, uh, agriculture that is not uh, that is not working with the nature. So, because they are not working with the nature when it uh, comes to uh, heavy rain, of course, the topsoil will begin washed down to the river and become shallow. And uh, <clears throat> because it becomes shallow, so uh, the uh, the diversity of the river also change, and uh, so many so many uh, bad things happen, like like uh, fish got, got poisoned because of this. Uh, soil coming down with all the fertilizers so we are facing the same problem but it's not reversible you know when 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 you uh work with the with the people you need to to address their problem and also the environment problem this is what we've been doing in uh, with us and bringing for for a while that's why we go with the people and stay with them for a few months sleep with them eat their foods you know, and 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 uh, uh, listen to them, and and uh, at the end we assess uh, the the whole village with them, the con including the nature and everything, and then we, like I said, tailored like five years program how to to develop their uh, environment uh, and also economy and also culture without destroying the nature, and and it's it's difficult but it's doable. Uh, cause uh, you're welcome to visit some of our communities already working, if you want to, and uh, but it is doable. Thank you. If nobody has a question for the moment, just a, a reaction um, to the question of Jerome, which was addressed to our colleagues uh, of the School of Sinology. Um, on the uh, local participation uh, in the management of the Mekong, or at least the local advocacy. Uh, a few days ago, I re we received a master thesis of a student uh, from uh, Paris 8, uh, under the supervision of Isabel saint mezar maybe you know her. Uh, and she did some research in, um, in Northern Thailand and uh, in Southern Laos uh, about the protest again, uh, against hydroelectric dams on the Mekong River. And she particularly documents different uh, advocacies uh, and um, grassroots uh, initiatives. Uh, and it's interesting to, to mention two um, schemes. The first one is in 2014, the United Nations established the Convention on the Law of the, no the Non-Navigational Uses of International Water Courses. Uh, it's a convention which um, mentions that uh, the countries need the consultation of member countries in the event of infrastructure projects. Uh, and among others, the obligation not to cause significant damage in the preservation of ecosystems, but uh, only Vietnam in Southeast Asia has uh, signed the agreement. And another uh, process is the um, procedures for notification, prior consultation, and agreement, PNPACA, 
and these procedures are designed to better include the concerns of local populations in the construction process. So it is interesting to mention because it was particularly the, the point of the question of Jérôme. And uh, she mentions that according to, to the International Rivers Conference in Southeast Asia, there is a lack of consideration given the local uh, communities in the decision-making process regarding the hydraulic engineering process in the Mekong. She mentioned different NGOs, associations, Maybe you are familiar with uh, Comnet Mekong, Rakhiang Kong, etc. So, yeah, it's a, it's a kind of work documenting these uh, local initiatives. Thank you. 